and I'm joining you from Migori County in uh, the western part of Kenya. So kindly uh, share with us where you're joining us from, your name, the institution you're representing, your expectations for the webinar, and also your location. We'd really appreciate to learn more about where you're joining us from today. This webinar has been organized by members of the Faith-Based Restoration Action Group, which is an action group that was formed last year after the Kenya National Landscape Restoration Conference. And its purpose, number one, is to share the work of faith communities, uh, or rather the work of the Faith Action Group and the members of, of various faith communities who are working in Kenya to, re to, do, to restore and just discuss bottlenecks, uh, discuss opportunities, and how we can address them. And lastly, to discuss how we can share knowledge and restoration um, with faith communities. So this webinar is going to take place over the next um, three hours. And it's basically divided into th uh, four main segments. We're going to have a short opening. And then we're going to have two segments of presentations, which will have a Q&A in between. And that's where we're going to really showcase the work. The faith communities present will have the opportunity to showcase their work and share what they're doing, discuss challenges, opportunities, and just some key messages and what they envision the future to be. Then we'll have a panel discussion, just trying to look at the way forward. What's the way forward with faith-based restoration? How can we move it forward and a closing? So uh, just before I hand it over to uh, Alan, who would be taking us through the opening, um, giving us a background of the action group, the journey and the achievements, I'd like us to take part in the chat blast. And the question will be, why do you think faith, a faith-based approach to restoration is important? So don't answer the question yet, just type it. Uh, just type it in the, just type it and I'll give you a prompt. So the question is, why do you think a faith-based approach to landscape restoration is important? Thank you, Mika. Restoration is linked to spirituality and faith communities can strongly support restoration. Thank you. Looking forward to see more. People of faith are stewards of a common home. Thank you, Ashley. When faith, Bertha says that when faiths mobilize the religious communities, much can be achieved. Can be achieved. Sorry. Great. Yes, faith. Uh, Jimmy has said that the holy book, oh, fantastic. God is the creator of everyone. Um, and we're stewards of creation. Sustainable environment is linked to peaceful coexistence. Um, faith plays an important role in shaping societies and responses. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your great responses. And I have, I'll just hand over to Alan, who will take us through the next segment of this presentation yeah um hello good morning everybody um i hope my colleague uh, and Katha is able to join um and then she may go through the powerpoint i just wanted to share uh just a few thoughts it struck me this morning to share the genesis of this you may be interested sometimes we see something on the surface but of course what are the roots and you can't quite see those. Uh, and there are actually two uh, Waze who are really the inspiration uh, behind this uh, development, which I think is quite a um, pioneering development in, in, in the world really. Um, and that's not surprising considering how distinguished these Waze are. Um, so when I was uh, living and working in Kenya, I had two mentors and they were helping me not just in, in my work, but in my vocation, in my life. Uh, and one of those was Reverend Dr. Sam Cobia. Many of you may know him. Um, he was the former uh, General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. And uh, uh, he's of course serving as the chair of the National Cohesion Integration Commission currently. And the other was uh, Dr. Dennis Garrity, uh, who was the former director general of ICRA. And these two gentlemen, uh, we would have brainstorming meetings. They were very uh, kind uh, to me in my own struggles and search for my vocation. And out of that brainstorming, this, this thought of faith-based land restoration, and Dennis said, we'll host one. Let's host a, a workshop at ICRA 2017. And Reverend Kobia sent a special message. And some of those who are with us today, 
now, uh, including Sheikh uh, Lithome. Um, uh, uh, there are others here, um, but at that time, a retired Anglican bishop uh, in Zimbi uh, and others came. I think it was the first time ever that a CGIAR uh, research in international institution had invited faith leaders to say, we need your help. And I think it's not, so, it's not coincidental that it's happened in, in Kenya, in Africa. Uh, as one of the uh, thoughts that Laura shared, somehow religion and spirituality is, 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 is so present. And unfortunately, I feel unfortunately, somehow it's been at arm's length or a distance between science and religion in <clears throat> coming out of Europe and coming through the kind of development of thinking. So it was an amazing thing. It started. And I think all those ripples continued and somehow you never know how those things kind of pick up, they, they grow, they came into the national conference um, and, 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 and through that national conference springboarded out under the Regreening Africa program into this. And look at that now, I mean, 109 participants <laughs> kind of joining this. I think it's such an amazing, it's been so you know incredible to see, to see this. And I think it's such a, a, a interesting development that, that really is, gives so much hope. And it'll be so interesting to hear from, from many of the, from everybody today and, and take this to a whole new, new level. So I just wanted to share those, those thoughts. This uh, slide I can see is of a group who came together to do the Empowered Worldview uh, training in land restoration. Uh, combining the empowered worldview, which we'll hear about later from World Vision, with how land restoration uh, can be encouraged. <clears throat> so this is one of the uh, offshoots of the uh, from the National Conference and the Faith-Based Action Group. So next slide. So the purpose of the group, um, how we can all contribute to the overall goal, the goal of scaling restoration in Kenya, and to achieve that, the, the capacity building that's needed for faith communities uh, through webinars, and of course also for our uh, restoration scientific community to, to know how best to engage with, with faith communities, which is one of the learnings we hope will come out of this webinar. Next slide. Wow, look at that. I have an amazing <laughs> to see that exactly. So there you can see uh, the workshop on the left, 2017, of which I gave you the, the roots, uh, and then germinating for three or four years underground until, boom, it came out in the National Landscape Restoration Conference. And from there, you can see how it's accelerated with the formation of the action group. Uh, and then there was a, a, a workshop at the All Africa Conference of Churches uh, uh, some months back. Uh, and that springboarded these other workshops um, and now this particular webinar. Next slide. So uh, some of you will have been part of the, the conference, but particularly the faith base where we're all coming under is movement building and leveraging. Next slide. And we had this session, uh, which was the role of faith communities in the management and restoration of land. And we were exploring the synergies and the opportunities for faith-based organizations to promote landscape restoration at grassroots level in Kenya. And look at all those organizations which are involved there supporting this, coming together around this, uh, around this approach, which I think, uh, I think we haven't seen that anywhere in the world at this kind of level of focus. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So uh, the group that met, uh, an interfaith group, were Muslims, Pentecostalists, you know, independent churches, Catholics, Hindus, developed a action plan, uh, a call to action for all faith communities, so very much an interfaith approach. Um, and then uh, part of that, uh, it was said, what needs to be done is to document success stories, which can be shared, create the visibility of existing success stories and testimonials. So this whole webinar is actually very much part of fulfilling this action plan 
and it's even coming in the correct dates there. <laughs> so look at, and then uh, having these webinars, which are ongoing on faith-based land restoration. Next slide. So I hope we've given there an overview uh, of the journey and, and how we've got to where we are right now. Back to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Alan, for that overview, for presenting the journey that this group has come from, where it all started from the 2017 workshop, the conference last year, the action group, and now where the group is headed, um, as displayed through the uh, action plan that you've just presented. So uh, I think Katha has joined us and she can take us through the next segments, two segments of this webinar, and that will be on presentations, just showcasing the work of various faith communities here. So um, if Don can please share your slides, if you can share your screen and share the slides, then we can go on and Katha, kindly, you're welcome. Um, Katha is, the pro is a program manager at ICO Diplomatique, and she, ICO Diplomatique is one of the organizations that's leading this action group. So over to you, Katha. Good morning, and thank you so much, Laura. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Okay, I want to greet everybody warmly, and thank you all for showing up. This is quite a momentous webinar that we have put together. And uh, we really look, look forward to your participation. And more importantly, we really want to showcase what has been going on uh, in the background together, as well as um, the plan that we have for the future. Thank you, Alan, for the good uh, overview that you gave. Uh, it's interesting to see where the genesis of this started. Of course, a lot of faith-based uh, entities have been working in the area of land restoration, but uh, there was a particular genesis, as Alan said, where uh, there was a strategic and structured way of uh, creating partnerships and working towards land restoration and preservation. And so what I want to do now is to invite uh, different um, organizations, representatives from different organizations, to showcase the work that they have been doing in the recent past, so that we can see what in practice, what does this really mean for faith institutions to work towards land restoration? Uh, moving forward, we're going to have two sessions uh, with a Q&A in between each. And the first session is session one, where we will have uh, four organizations, which are the Catholic Youth Network on Environment and Sustainability in Africa, SINESA, We'll also hear from Laudato Si Movement. We'll hear from Supreme Council of Kenya Muslims, SUPKEM. And we'll also hear from IRCK, which is the Inter-Religious Council of Kenya. So let's start now with Catholic Youth Network on Environment and Sustainability in Africa, Tanessa. And I call upon David Munene. Please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Um, Kath, I think that he may be having um, some issues with his network, so maybe I'll, I'll chat. Okay, with him later. Okay, we'll come back. Yes. We'll come back to David. We'll come back to David Munene. We certainly would like to obviously hear what Sinessa does and has been doing. So we'll give you a bit of time and proceed on to Ashley Kitisia of the Laudato Si movement. Welcome, Ashley. Thanks, Kava. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ashley Kitisia, representing Laudato Si Movement. And uh, I, let me just try and share my screen. I hope we don't get into any challenges. Um, okay. Um, yeah, but uh, I'm so happy to to be here today to share about Laudato Si movement. And this is a coalition of Catholics that is working towards caring for our common home. And the Laudato Si movement was started after the encyclical written by Pope Francis. And this is a document that uh, our dear Pope Francis wrote in 2015, just ahead of the Paris Agreement um, on caring for our common home. And it is a very unique uh, piece of writing, especially for the people of the Catholic faith, because 
it started addressing the issues of uh, the earth and what is happening right now with a lot of pollution and a lot of uh, these targets and false solutions. And our Pope was just sharing a lot about how he is concerned that we are not really doing enough to care for our common home and to stop the adverse effects of climate change, even though the poor are the most adversely affected by it. And so after the Laudato Si encyclical came about, the Laudato Si movement was started shortly afterwards. And uh, this has been an organization that has been working in prayer, working with um, the spirit-led sort of programs, and also a lot of advocacy programs with people of the grassroots to care for our common home and to mobilize more people to care for our common home. So we work very closely with people from the grassroots who are referred to as Laudato Si animators. And uh, anyone can become a Laudato Si animators. We usually have an online training that takes six weeks where you learn more about the Laudato Si encyclical, you learn more about praying and collaborating in order to change your lifestyle as a person and also be involved in making a local contribution towards addressing the climate crisis in your locality. And so we have a lot of uh, member organizations and circles once you become a Laudato Si animator, which includes a Laudato Si circle or a Laudato Si chapter. And this is how our movement connects with various people and various initiatives to really implement the work of Laudato Si. And so we work together with the Vatican and uh, many other member organizations that are faith-based and also the, and also very uh, civil society, depending on the values and if we have shared values and we all uh, can find common ground to work together, we have a way of ensuring that we bring as many people on board to be able to accomplish our mission. And so the Laudato Si movement was formerly called the Global Catholic Climate Movement, but it went through a synodal process where it now adopted the name Laudato Si movement. And it has three goals, which is the ecological conversion. So this is the eco-spiritual activities that we undertake, such as contemplation, we have a Laudato Si prayer book, which we use as a resource for various prayers. We also have sustainability programs where we advocate for sustainable transition and living lifestyles that are very simple and do not really contribute to emissions. And then our third goal is prophetic advocacy, where we take out to advocate and lobby for policy changes, ambitious NDCs, and a lot of um, uh, collaborations to be able to address issues of climate change and also landscape restoration. And so our Laudato Si animators in Africa are very active. We are present in over 30 countries and counting. So we have 30 official chapters, but we have members who are from all parts of Africa participating in Laudato Si work and also landscape restoration. And so I'd like to share some pictures here of various animators. All these uh, pictures were taken during season of creation, which takes place from the 1st of September to the 4th of October every year, where we have a almost month long, five week long uh, uh, practice where we carry out eco-spiritual activities together in various parts of the world. And so everyone is welcome to participate. We also do this with various faith-based organizations, um, such as our brothers uh, present in uh, like Sinessa and the Green Anglicans. And we work on landscape restoration and other advocacy activities, all touching on climate change. And so this was in Kenya on the bottom left where some police officers were gifted some seedlings 
in Nigeria, there was a tree planting activity. There was a coastal cleanup and also uh, some mangrove tree planting in Cameroon. And then we also had some trainings on how to uh, manage the rainfall uh, water during uh, season of creation time. And this was also in Nigeria. And we usually have uh, two main uh, annual celebrations. So we have the Laudato Si Week, which takes place on May. Um, and it's a whole week to celebrate the release of the encyclical Laudato Si. And during this time, we encourage our animators to carry out various activities that they are interested in. Usually, after you take up the training of Laudato Si animators, you are prompted to choose a project of your choice, which you are supported to continue even after the training. So we find that most animators already have ongoing work depending on their interests and touching on environmental matters. And then we also have the season of creation, which I had just mentioned. This happens later in the year in September. And then we have the Laudato Si chapters. Now the Laudato Si chapters are country specific uh, secretariats where they come up with annual plans relating to Laudato Si and they are empowered and connected to continue the work independently um, away from the movement and uh, they are they have ongoing projects where many members can join on a need basis and they even have uh, programs for young people. So this movement serves Catholic individuals and institutions worldwide and it helps them bring Laudato Si to life and bring God's creation. And uh, I had shared about the Laudato Si animators training. This is available online and this is how you become a member of the Laudato Si movement as an individual. We also have uh, avenues to have member organizations join us and work with us. Then we have the Laudato Si contemplation training. This is also an online course and this is more eco-spiritual where they meet once a month to contemplate on Laudato Si. And then we have regional advocacy activities in various African countries. And now we also have a very vibrant uh, Laudato Si chapter in Kenya. Actually, the biggest number of Laudato Si animators uh, comes from Kenya, maybe because also the Laudato Si African office is housed here in Nairobi in Karen. And uh, during Laudato Si week, we have uh, a lot of religious people such as the, the sisters and the brothers and various um, congregations join and carry out um, restoration activities in their communities and also in their regions. And on the left here, we can see that there was a herb garden that was started at the St. Joseph Mercy Hospital. And this is an ongoing project where they carry out this planting of herbs that they use for themselves. So this is the sustainability aspect of things, while also being able to share the surplus with the communities around them. Then we have a vibrant animator in Machakos. His name is Peter Kimeu, and he carries out a lot of empowering uh, of uh, people in his community to be able to embrace more uh, tree planting. As we know, Machakos is part of the uh, dry parts of Kenya, and the, he carries out a lot of training to empower these uh, ladies to be able to support themselves for one and also work very closely with the forest there. There is a Mount Carmel area where he has worked with the Kenya Forest Service to ensure that there is restoration on growing tree planting. They have a, a lot of seedlings and projects where they are able to uh, start little nurseries for these forests and they have kept track and records of all the various uh, trees that have been planted over time when they were planted and they ensure that no one interferes or comes to graze in that forest and this has also come outside the forest and gotten into the local areas where they also volunteer their parcels of land to be able to carry out uh, landscape restoration. Then we have a 
medical mission sisters here in Nairobi who are also having a a tree nursery initiative where they share this with the people around and they also sell them to be able to grow some trees. And we also have a coastal um, seaweed farming. This was in Kuala Lumpur. Actually, County. you have one minute left too. Thanks, That's Laura. It. Yeah, so this was in Kuala County and uh, also tree planting in Subukia. So we have member organizations in Kenya who are vibrant. There are so many, but I had to mention a, a few. We have the Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation Franciscan Africa, and they carry out restoration activities and trainings and capacity building for various people of the Franciscan fraternity uh, all over Kenya. Then we have Mother Earth Network, which is a trust. This was founded by Father Haman Borg, who has been working in restoration of the Mao region since the 80s. And then uh, a notable one is the Birthday Tree Planting Campaign, which is a new tradition for young people to celebrate birthdays by cutting cake and planting trees. And this is usually housed at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. This amazing group of partners was able to come up with an ecological education uh, uh, course where they are proposing a faith-based organization, uh, faith-based education for sustainable development to be adopted in schools in Kenya. And this textbook is available. And um, for those who will have further questions, there will be more details uh, about this. And um, we get back to why this is so important to Laudato Si movement. In Laudato Si, our Pope reminds us that everything is interconnected and that we use each other's talents and skills to protect and support our common home. And so if you'd like to learn more about Laudato Si, you may read the encyclical, but we also have this amazing resource, which is a film that is available on YouTube titled The Letter. So you may watch the letter or you may also host a screening near you. And we hope that we will get ambitious NDCs to tackle the climate crisis and not really dwell upon false solutions. We also hope that we'll have a movement of individuals that is united in diversity, working together to care and restore for our common home. And we hope to inspire more people of faith to join the cause of restoration as we are the stewards of our common home. If you'd like to learn more about Laudato Si movement, please visit our website. It's just on the screen. And uh, thank you so much, Laura, and for the amazing work that you're doing and the team. And I hand it back to you, Nkaba. Thank you so much, Ashley. This is a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us have learned and heard about what we might not have known previously about Laudato Si. It's a coalition of Catholics working for caring for our home, the earth. And in 2015, Pope Francis wrote a document uh, from which uh, they base a lot of their work. Um, we will now move on to um, Sinessa. David Munene, are you able to share your screen at the moment? Yes, uh, just taking my audio, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. So I'll present about the inclusion of faith-based communities in restoration efforts in Kenya. My name is David Gigi Monene. All right, so let me just proceed uh, with the introduction to Sinesa. So this is a network of young Catholics in Africa that are dedicated to caring for our common home and to address the twin challenges of environmental degradation and climate change from a faith perspective. Our purpose is to nurture an ecological conversion in people, young people especially, and their communities that is deeply rooted in the Catholic social teaching principles on care for creation and especially preferential option for the poor by developing an active network of young people that brings together the human family in pursuit of sustainable and integral development. Our work is tailored in three areas, formation and awareness creation, where we work to journey with young people to develop the holistic person that is conscious of the environment and can therefore engage in a journey of ecological conversion. We also advocate for things uh, uh, that, that we feel are not in line with the human with the human dignity, and we also advocate 
for things that will be able to help us as, uh, save our common home. But we also engage in local grassroots action and this helps us now to engage with the communities on the ground. And I will proceed to share one of those local grassroots actions as um, an example of our restorative efforts. Our motivation is deeply rooted in the scriptures. It's a divine obligation. We understand that land does not belong to anyone. It is permanently God's and should not be sold out. Leviticus from chapter 19 and um, explains this very well, but in 25, it is a bit more explicit about even how to handle land ownership because it belongs to the Lord. Every Sunday and during the main solemnities of the Catholic Church, we profess the Nicene Creed or the profess our faith. And in it, we believe in a God who created the heaven and earth and invisible and that includes land. Catholic social teaching principles, especially on care for creation, call on us to make sure that we are good stewards of that which God created and so that it was beautiful. It is inherently African as a young person and any other person that is Pan-African that we believe as a person, for example, I came from the land and I shall return and forever connected with everyone that from this land. The now of God in our loins to those that we have already begun sharing, we are responsible for handing over land that is arable, the land that is productive, land that is pleasing to them and to the eyes of God. It is the only way we can be able to become painfully aware and listen to the cry of the earth and cry of the poor as explicated in Laudato Si the people and see people. I will give examples of how our restorative journey began with one of the projects that we worked on. In 2018 in Zambia, my executive director Alan Otaro and one of the deputy executive directors Harui Modandazi visited Kasisi Agricultural Training Center in Zambia and the Jesuit Development Farm to see what could be done in terms of restoration. On the picture on the left, you can see the difference between restored land and land that which has not been worked on from the background there. Now, when we did this, we also began our building capacity of our young people and their communities about land restoration and what they could do also to create green entrepreneurship out of the land that they perhaps are running away from to go to the urban centers in pursuit of jobs. Our restorative activities will focus on one project that was taking place in Kirinyaga County at um, in the Catholic Diocese of Moranga. The Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Ranga, his Lordship James Maria Wainaina, was gracious enough to allow us to work on a two-acre piece of land that would act as a demo site on good land restoration practices and organic farming. However, however, because the land is not located within the church compound, we felt that it was important for us to create a mini demonstration site within the church compound. And the first thing that we noticed is that there was scarcity of water because the area is very dry. And what we worked on was to restore a borehole or rehabilitate a borehole that was in existence but had stalled for quite some years. To the left, you can see that, that we were able to successfully do that. To the right, we are setting up a mini demo site together with the community, uh, workers, men, women, and youth. After some time, we figured that we did not have adequate resources, for example, to run the project to the end. However, on the left, we were able to work on this mini demonstration site within the church compound and it is being run by the youth who are now selling the produce to the congregants and also the church is not uh, paying now to purchase water for cleaning and the water that we we were able to generate out of the borehole now is being given to the community shopping center free of charge we then handed over the equipment that we had intended to use on the two acre piece of land to the director of caritas in the catholic diocese of Muranga, in the presence of the vicar general and I'm flanked to the left by our able deputy country director for Kenya, Alphonse Muya. And to the right uh, of Elizabeth, the Caritas director, is another Elizabeth who works with us as a finance officer in Kenya. And this was done through after a mass uh, on the land to pray for the land for productivity, as well as to bless the equipment and in the presence of the community that you are working with. This enabled, the handing over enabled a scale up. For example, on that two acre piece of land we had dug we could only do with the resources we had a 30,000 liter water pan but after handing over to the caritas they were able to work with partners and ground groundwork that we had laid upon to drill a 1.5 million liter water pan that is also going to serve as a commercial fish pond where the youth and the community can learn about fish farming 
the challenges and opportunities. Land access is a big challenge because people want to hold on to the land. And even when they, have, they see the promise of its restoration, they actually do not believe that it is going to work to the extent that it will remain their land. Financial scarcity. We would have wanted to run a massive scale of projects around the continent, but we are only able to do a small scale and we are happy with what we did, but we are hopeful that the resources will be adequate for us to be able to restore more of church and institutional land as we go ahead. The disruption of the status quo basically means people are used to doing a certain things a certain way. For example, in Kirinyaga County, people use a lot of herbicides, a lot of uh, pesticides, and a lot of chemicals, uh, treated seeds, and disrupting that to, for example, minimum tillage uh, or farming God's way becomes a bit of a problem because people just want to remain in their comfort zones. Extensive degradation takes time. Land takes time to be degraded. Uh, it is resilient, but it takes time to be degraded. And restoration takes as much time, but people want instant coffee solutions and may not be patient enough. External forces. In the land where we were working in the two-acre piece of land, we faced such external forces that were pulling us down. For example, vandalism and so on. We were able to circumvent this by having someone uh, stay on the land uh, housed with their family. And this is helping with the security issues. This is something we had not foreseen since the community had assured that us that the security was good at the place. This Just political interference. One more minute, Milena. Thank you. Uh, political interference in this case does not refer to the project we are working on. We had sought to green the hills in uh, Muranga County, but some of the people did not feel that uh, we were doing this as a genuine effort and therefore they did not even engage in the commencement dialogue. Opportunities. There is a lot of land that is available in our country and that could be restored. And this includes, uh, let's not focus just on the rural areas, but also in the urban areas and the peri-urban areas as well. There is growing awareness that our land is not becoming as productive as we would like it to be, and we would like to change that, and people are buying into the idea of land restoration. We are connected to the land inherently as Africans. For example, the history of our independence in Kenya is deeply rooted in, in, in pursuit of land ownership, and that's how we got our freedom and independence. The, the lessons learned. Start small with what you have and do what you can, but make sure that the little things you do, you deliver them on a grand scale. Always have a backup plan. You never know what will happen. COVID pandemic could happen. People could shift their focus. Political interference as well could happen. Always have a backup plan. Work with institutions that are established. To the right, I have a picture of a priest we are working with in Duala, Cameroon, to restore land within the parish. And working with the parish or with the, with the priest or the church allows us to be able to tap into communities and the people they work with. The, your emergency on land restoration is not the emergency of the owners of the land. Please don't treat it as such. Let them buy in into the need for that restoration before you impose it on them. The key message is land is an emotive issue. It remains as so, especially in our country. You might want to approach it with caution and wisdom. Faith communities offer you multiple entry points and implementation points. By going through a faith community, you can be able to tap into other non-faith communities, into institutions. You can be able to work with schools. You can be able to work with very many other stakeholders, including households. Ready yourself for ignorance, people who don't know what's happening to them, but their land is not productive, and they do not even know what's, what, what to do. But also ready yourself for arrogance. Some people know what the problem is, what the solutions are, but they just don't care. There are those who know what's happening, what they can do about it, but they just feel helpless and defeated. Solve the most immediate problem before restoring. We solved the water problem, we were able to work on restoration. Water is paramount to this, and always make sure that you prepare to hand over to stakeholders and people with better capacity or the owners of the land. Thank I take this you. opportunity to thank you for your audience, and if you want to get in touch with us, those are our contacts. Thank you. Thank you very much, David Munene from Sinesa. That was a great presentation and also inspiring in as far as you're working with the young people. The young people we have come to see actually, they're very energetic, they're very committed, and really they're a key part of uh, land restoration. Um, in your presentation, uh, you outlined the work that you do. You gave us key examples from Kirinyaga and Moranga. And you have uh, also explained very well that it's rooted in scripture and is inherently African. 
And uh, what I like is also that uh, as much as that's the case, you have also uh, told us that some of the lessons learned is that it's also good to work with non-faith-based groups. They also have um, a lot to offer. And thank you for those uh, photos. A picture is worth a thousand words, they say. And really seeing that 1.5 meter, 1.5 million meter water pump uh, really shows that, you know, together, a lot of work can be done in this area of land restoration. Okay, thank you very much, David. We're going to move now to the next presentation. We have from Supkem, Hakim Khalid, Supreme Council of Kenya, uh, Supreme Council of Kenya Muslims. Welcome, Hakim. Now, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Hakim Khalid from uh, Supkem, Supreme Council of uh, Kenya Muslims. And uh, I will be showcasing what the, the council ha has been doing uh, uh, in regards to restoration activities in Kenya. So uh, before I kick, I kick off by showing you what we are doing as the, the council, I want to, to introduce you to our, 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 our organization and to actually show you what uh, SUPKEM is all about. So Supreme Council of Kenya Muslim is registered as the umbrella body of all Muslim organizations, societies, mosques and groups in Kenya. Its mission is to provide leadership that pre presents the in interest of Muslims through collaboration and partnership. And its vision is, to, is a unifying premier body in Kenya. So one of its, uh, its objective is to actually carry out and discharge in any way possible the obligation responsibilities that Muslim owe as a, as a community or individuals to Islam. Also is to unify all, all Muslims in, in Kenya. So our motivation is uh, through our scriptures and the hadith of uh, our, our prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Environment protection and restoration are important aspects uh, of Islam. Allah in the Holy Quran states that it, it is he who has appointed you, viceroys on earth, that he may try you in what he has given you. As stewards of uh, Allah's creation, Muslims are tasked with the maintenance and restoration of the environment proactively. The Islam attitude towards environment and natural resource conservation is not only hinged on prohibition of uh, exploitation, but also on sustainable development. The idea is clear captured uh, in Surah 7, verse 32 of the Holy Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O, o children of, of Adam, act and eat and drink, but waste not by excess, for Allah loves not the wasters. Addition, we can learn about uh, restoration through our holy prophets uh, in one of the hadiths where he states that there is none among us the Muslims who plants a tree or sows seeds and then a bird or a person or an animal eats from it, but is regarded as charitable gift for, for him. So we draw our motivation from our holy scriptures and the hadiths of uh, our prophet, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Next. So, uh, a couple of activities we engage in uh, in regards to land, 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 landscape uh, restoration are landscaping and tree planting. For instance, in the picture, you can see that uh, students from uh, uh, Masai Mara University, they were, they were engaged in a landscape uh, uh, activity and tree planting in a, uh, Narok forests. So also uh, Subkem and uh, Masai Mara University students, they have been uh, rehabilitating 
the, the Narok forest, which is popularly known as uh, uh, Mau, Mau, Mau forests. So th those are also the, the pictures from Mau forests. Tree planting exercise in Narok. Also, we have been uh, collaborating with other uh, players, for instance, other religious leaders from other uh, regions, and also business, business uh, stakeholders. For instance, in Spokia, you can see we were in a tree planting exercise where we engaged uh, all the stakeholders. So we also we also did the uh, tree planting in the Subukia Sub County Hospital. So all these are all the tree planting exercise we engage in. Also, we have been rehabilitating the Kenyan coasts, whereby Subkem and other Christian leaders uh, have been engaging in uh, 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 growing or uh, growing of uh, uh, mangrove. Along the, along, along the Kenyan coasts. For instance, in, in the picture, you can see that uh, they were doing the, uh, the rehabilitation of Tudor Creek at the Kenyan coasts. So also as Subkem, we also do cleanup days. For instance, we did one in Subukia. So also we, we do climate change workshops where we, we sensitize the public. Uh, on the importance of climate change and the best mitigation and uh, adaptation uh, measures and action they can uh, they can take so we also do the forums like climate change forums where we we involve all the the stakeholders and the, the community so that uh, we educate them on the importance of climate change and the best and the best uh, uh, agricultural practices. So, why faith-driven land restoration is necessary? Faith-driven approach in land restoration is important because it promotes the understanding that land restoration is viable is a viable way to improve livelihoods, enhance food security, climate climate change resilience, also. Faith institutions and leaders play a pivotal role in land restoration movements due to their influence and resources. In many occasions, faith organizations are efficient implementation partners because they can mobilize, raise awareness, and influence behavior change with tremendous ease as they are trusted by the communities. So the future plans on land restoration. So we are planning to mainstream environment conservation in all activities and ceremonies, such as weddings, graduation, during Quran recitation, uh, competitions, each celebration where participants are encouraged to plant at least a tree, developing an, envirom developing an environmental training manual with Islamic teachings on conservation of an environment, conduct, conducting training and training of trainers, TOTs, for religious leaders and Muslim societies and organizations around the country, conducting workshops around the country on environmental protection, conservation, and land restoration, training youths, women, and persons living with disabilities on environmental, on environmental issues and building capacity by off offering them with the seed capital to start up tree nurseries and landscaping business, scaling greening activities in schools, hospitals, bus, bus parks, and uh, recreation centers. Next. You have one minute, Hello. Uh, okay, thank you. So the kind of support we require Okay, one is uh, financial support in sowing and maintaining seeds, publication and environmental journals and training manuals, capacity building programs and workshops. Also, we need uh, support in training, best farming practices and proper adaptation and mitigation measures and actions required to respond to climate change. So, uh, 
I thank you for that. And I'm looking forward to uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hakim Khaled. That was a wonderful presentation. And it's uh, very important that everyone uh, in attendance has gotten to know more about SoupChem, what SoupChem really is and what it does. And really it's, uh, it's, it's you know, wide involvement in land restoration. Uh, we're really happy to hear that um, uh, you promote uh, conservation activities, even in activities that are, you know, that happen in the community at even at the family level, such as graduation, wedding ceremonies and so forth. Thank you so much for that presentation. We're going to carry on with our program we're a little bit behind schedule and we want to make sure that we don't, that we include everything uh, that we have planned. So instead of having our Q&A after the IRCK presentation, we will just continue. And what I'll ask is that the presenters um, look in the chat, in the chat and try to answer the questions that are relevant to them. On our side, the technical team will also try and extract some key questions that we can bring up. Uh, to the presenters and the panelists at the end. So we are not going to do a Q&A session uh, after the next uh, presentation. We will just continue with the other presentations because of uh, time. And so now I'd like to call on the IRCK to give their presentation. We're going to hear from Anthony Blaze from the Interreligious Council of Kenya. Anthony, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Nkatha, so much, uh, Alan, uh, Dawa, Laura, uh, and the team for organizing such a, such a great uh, workshop for us to share what uh, religious leaders are doing, the faith uh, uh, communities are doing. I am Anthony uh, Blaze. I'm a program officer at IRCK. Um, IRCK is Interreligious Council of Kenya. Uh, specifically, the Environment and Climate Change Program. Uh, that strives to promote uh, environmental conservation and climate change management at places of worship. Uh, there's a lot that we are doing, but uh, I will only focus on reclaiming our green uh, because uh, the, 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 the discussion here is about land restoration and tree growing. Uh, we also have other initiatives like our sacred waters that looks at uh, water ecosystem and how to fight plastic pollution, uh, marine pollution. Uh, but uh, uh, I'll go. Uh, I'll go straight to my presentation. So reclaiming RCK is a coalition, and uh, thanks Ashley, uh, uh, Hakim. Uh, I've also seen uh, Pastor Jack, uh, Madam Sujeta, who are all members of RCK. RCK is a is a coalition of all major faith communities uh, that works to deepen interfaith dialogue and fellowship uh, among members for a common endeavor, and they are. The common endeavor is to mobilize resources and uh, uh, and uh, and and uh, their moral resources to address uh, degradation and, and, and climate change. Um, just uh, a, a reflection, uh, if I may, just say that uh, we are made up of uh, the Supreme Council of uh, Kenya, uh, Subkem. You have heard from uh, 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 Hakim, the Seventh Day Adventist, SDA National. Muslim Leaders Forum, NAMLEF, the KCCB, you, you heard from uh, uh, Ashley uh, Ladatu C. Uh, we also have the Hindu Council of Kenya, uh, the Organization of African Institute Churches, the Evangelical Alliance of Kenya, that is the, 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 the Anglicans, you have heard about the Green Anglican Movement. Uh, we also have the, the Shia uh, and uh, the National Council of Churches of Kenya, uh, who are, 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 are members. Uh, of, 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 of RCK. Um, yes, so straight, uh, our motivation is that living in harmony with nature is a common ethical behavior. It's a common ethical behavior uh, advocated in our teachings and scriptures uh, of all, not just Kenya faith traditions, but across the globe. Uh, and this is particularly pertinent today at a time when we are faced with so much uh, uh, crisis. Uh, I think uh, this generation uh, is uh, climate change and uh, degradation is, is the current modern uh, uh, crisis we are facing uh, uh, that affects us negatively. Everywhere 
uh, regardless of your, your faith. Um, yes, uh, and another motivation is that around 84% of uh, the population, that is really a motivation, is affiliated to one or more uh, of the religions and, and spiritual communities in existence today. So even those who have joined, you are, you are aligned, you're affiliated to one or, or two or three, to one of those uh, uh, religions. So if we can actually mobilize uh, the faith people, uh, we, we, we can address the issue uh, uh, effectively. The faith people also own a very big chunk of habitable land, which uh, unfortunately have been degraded, uh, giving them immense leverage uh, to contribute to the SDGs, particularly SDG 15, uh, looks, that looks about land uh, and, and control, there's, there's, there's efficient land uh, management. The FBOs uh, in, in our region, in Africa and uh, Kenya, actually 60% of schools, uh, we own them. Uh, as faith people, we have the faith-based schools. Uh, and so we can address uh, degradation, uh, restoration through SDG4, where uh, education uh, and capacity building is, 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 is pillared. Um, FBOs, uh, faith people are able to equip and, 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 and deploy. Uh, there are many adherents to volunteer uh, for a good cause. I think it's one of our presenters who talked about financial constraints as a, as, as a big uh, hindrance. And, uh, and, and people of faith, knowing that every Friday we go to Hootbars, every, every Saturday we go to our churches, and Sunday we go to our churches, we can volunteer. Uh, we, can, we can do this uh, uh, for, for, for our creator. Uh, just emphasizing on what uh, yesterday's remarks uh, during the COP27, the former US Vice, Chair, Vice President uh, Al Gore, who said that, uh, all the Abra Abrahamic traditions and also the Indic, God created two, gave us two, two things to choose from. You either choose life or you choose death. You either choose heaven or you choose uh, 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 hell. And uh, how you live, how we live, uh, we have lived in a way that we have degraded. We have to stop the degradation, the logging, uh, and, and, and the waste that, um, that uh, Hakim really talked about. So we can choose to be part and parcel of the restoration process uh, because there's no in between. There's either death or life. You're either part of the restoration or you're part of the degradation, uh, uh, part of it. Uh, and, uh, and he was very, very particular on that. Um, before I continue, uh, let's, let's remember that um, we give praise and gratitude to God, uh, the Lord of all beings, to the number of, of, of the stars in the sky, the drops of rain, the waves of, of the water, the leaves of the tree, the grains of sun, and all the atoms, everything that he created, the trees, every species, he didn't create it for nothing. He created it for a purpose. And that creation reflects the glory of God. Uh, uh, he is all sustaining uh, and the world beyond our grasp, we don't understand. And we, we, we live intricately uh, dependent on, on nature. Uh, and everything he has created is a sign of his power, uh, uh, a sign of his love, a sign of his mercy, and, and is upon us. I think Hakim talked about, uh, quoted a, a verse in Quran. Uh, there's also a part in Quran, 632, uh, uh, that talks about he created death. I was talking about that, death and life so that we can be tried, you can be tried. Which of you work the most good? Let us all work for the restoration process. Reclaiming our green, as I finish, is a tree uh, in the tree growing uh, land restoration process. And is a faith led. Uh, the main goal, of this reclaiming of green is you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so great to meet uh, most of you, Madam Jedida from the Greens of Africa Foundation, uh, Dr. Baraza, Azmaira, who are all in this movement. Uh, we have established demonstration sites at places of worship, as, as places of learning, because we have realized that our, our faith people need first to be built, their capacity need to be built. So demonstration plots as centers of learning 
and also we have planted trees. We 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 have grown. I'm being I'm, I'm always being told we grow trees, not plant trees. So we focus on the caring of, of that tree, the pruning of it, and we have involved students, uh, pupils, on how to water, how to mulch, how to think. Um, um, actually, uh, talked about the the, the, the information packs. The toolkit that some of our, the, the, the RCK uh, and other players engaged in the. Okay, I think Anthony's audio is having problems. He had one more minute remaining, uh, but I think he really has been able to give us a very good outline of what they have been doing. Uh, this is great to hear from him about really the how big of a pool the IRCK is. The Inter-Religious Council of Kenya under it has the National Council of Churches of Kenya, SUPKEM, the Hindu Council, and many, many others. And out of these organizations, some of them even have schools under them. So really, this really shows us that uh, we have, we have uh, almost uh, the whole population under the faith-based networks. In fact, he even gave uh, very accurate statistics saying that 84% of the population belongs to one of the world's religions. So this shows really the, you know, the, the, the amount of work that can be done, the progress that can be made when we start with faith-based organizations. Thank you very much, Anthony. I hope you can hear us, even though we were not able to hear you anymore towards the end. Asante Sana. Next, we're going to proceed with um, our next three presentations. We're going to have the Minda Trust. We will have the Eleka Trust. And then we will have Olive, Olive Branch Mission. And then after this, we will see how to uh, manage our time and then uh, have a Q&A possibly after that before proceeding to our last session. So for now, I want to welcome the Minda Trust. We have Mariam Wamboy, Zuhura Juma, and Halima Halmoud. Welcome. In the meantime, as she's sharing the screen, I'll, I'll just want to introduce uh, our topic is Mkoko Niuhai. Mkoko meaning the mangrove tree. Um, our organization started as a, as a lobby group in 2008. Then it was officially uh, it was officially registered as a trust in 2009. Our specific objectives are to contribute to land reforms debate by actively lobbying and advocating for expansion of the policy space in rural and marginalized communities to proactively engage the duty bearers. Uh, there's the promotion of peaceful interfaith engagement and collaboration with multi agencies. And then we are advocating for economic empowerment uh, of women, including but not limited to education, health, and business opportunity platforms. Uh, we facilitate and strengthen strategy, strategic linkages between grassroots uh, based organizations and marginalized groups with the, non, the land non state actors. Uh, our motivation to engage in, in, in restoration is, <laughs> Dawn, I see you're still struggling with, uh, with the presentation, but I can still continue. Uh, motivation to engage in restoration is the Quran. Uh, the Quran glorifies nature and wildlife as an earthly heavens, which is a mirror to the uh, rich forest of, of the paradise above. In the Islamic faith, the environment is similar to good faith towards humanity and indeed God, since as Muslims, we all believe that. And Allah has, has told us in, two, in, uh, in Surah 2, verse 60, he says, and do not commit abuse on earth, spreading corruption. Once we start, we, when, we start rest we, when we don't restore these things, harmony, we, we will only end up polluting our own little bubble of survival. That is why God says our catastrophes are self-inflicted. Corruption has appeared throughout the land and sea by what the hands of man have earned. As if to give a wake-up call. Guys, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I thought I was speaking alone. <laughs> no, 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 we're all listening attentively. <laughs> Okay, okay. As if to give up a wake up call, people are told uh, this catastrophic in process can heal and eliminate social and natural disasters. 
by through but through belief and respect for human nature you remember allah has, has said we do not cause corruption but once we cause we cause corruption there's another verse that says that uh, if uh, so let them test part of the consequences of what they have done that perhaps they will return to their righteousness as in what it means is that now we are we are doing restoration because we had already done, learned the degradation so now we are suffering because we the, we cause the catastrophes our, our on our own so the activities that we are doing right now uh we are working with the fishermen to preserve mangrove tree since it's a home for fish and uh the research has said that uh the fish is reducing from the sea which is improving uh, which is increasing poverty level within the fisher farmers community uh within the mangrove some of the fishermen uh plant uh, beehives they keep beehives as well as sell honey as an income generating for their groups we have managed to plant more than 200,000 plus trees in a span of four months we've done this in Tuapa, matangoni this is in kilifi county there's Ntuapa, uh, Matangoni, uh, there's a place called Maya, Ntongani, and uh, there's a small island that is called Kadipiteni in Matangoni. So we've done that in, in those villages. Uh, we encourage uh, another uh, activity that we're doing is that we're encouraging the community to do kitchen farming as well as uh, re so as to reduce uh, kitchen expenses. Uh, which some of the members have had have, have already started and they're saying that it is it is helping like uh there's this plant oh the eggplant i normally say it in kiswahili nation beringanya so some of them are planting uh ok, uh mabenda in nitrogen okra some of them are, are planting okra tomatoes um uh, and eggplants and it has changed their life at some point so as an organization, we have seedlings that we plan to distribute to the mosques for land restorations in the religious institutions. You remember within the last meeting that we say that we will talk to some of the religious leaders for them to divert the water that is being used for ablution so that the water is not wasted, it goes to the trees. Some of the religious leaders have already started doing that. Uh, as I've said, some of the, uh, there's a photo now that don't, uh, the, the screen is not coming on so we have photos of uh, kitchen farming we have photos of mangrove planting and challenges and opportunities that we have one of the challenges that we are facing as a group is that the community has lack of knowledge from the co uh, on the significance of land restoration they cause land de degradation because uh they burn they burn charcoal uh they harvest soil and they harvest sand uh, from the land as a means of income generating for the majority of the community members. An opportunity would be we create awareness on the significance of land restorations, including uh, creating opportunities for alternative income generating activities. Uh, for example, if one has to build, uh, if one cut a mangrove tree, for building purposes, because by the end of the day, we have to use the trees for sometimes at some point for building purposes. One should plant and nature, nurture at least two or four mangrove trees. Another opportunity will be, now that we are working with the religious leaders, we work with the religious leaders to, uh, to preach at the religious institutions about land restoration and its benefits. Uh, advocate for existing laws on land to be impl implemented and then work with the learning institutions since and then include the children since they're the, the next generation that we're expecting that is going to restore land the lessons learned uh for some of the lessons learned is that we have learned that the religious the faith and traditional leaders are the most are the best to spread uh, the gospel about land restorations using this the scriptures we've heard from uh IRL that they are doing, they are using the scriptures uh, to preach about land restorations. So I think uh, will be the best. The religious leaders would be the best because they'll be using the scriptures, and everybody knows that one the the religious uh, leaders when they speak about uh, 
uh, uh, verses within the Quran, uh, the holy books, uh, people take them as the gospel truth. The community can practice land restoration as long as there are benefits attached to, to it, its, its business and envisioning uh, green, which is green pocket. So if they see the benefits of doing the land restoration, I think this is going to be a good opportunity. Then we involving the learning, the involving the learning institutions and land restorations is good for this and the future generations, including indigenous trees and its benefits. Like in, in uh, at the coast, we have the, the neem tree. We have the, the neem tree, which, which uh, it's, it's said that it cures more than 40 diseases. Those, this, the research is still going on. So we have trees that are, have benefits. So the, another thing, uh, another lessons that we, we, we learned is that working with different stakeholders is in different re regions fastens the spread of the knowledge on the same on land restorations. So the key messages, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say about this, about the environment, the world is sweet and green. And verily, Allah is going to install you as entrusted with pre uh, preservation and distribution of God's creation in it in order to see how you react. Based on this hadith, one on, may, on many reasons we can extract is that the Prophet وسلم, showed much care and concerns towards the environment and aimed at caring and protecting it wholeheartedly. One of the key messages is conserve our, uh, our resources as much as possible. Plant trees as a means of good deeds. Because in Islam, you're told if you, plant, if you do a good deed, then it follows you to the, to the grave. So keep the environment clean and safe. Practice sustainable consumption whenever possible. And lastly, care for all Allah's creation. Our collaboration. Mindatras is collaborating with COST, Education Center, COEC, planting trees, empowering women and youth on peaceful co coexistence. Mika Initiative was formed was a uh, Mika initiative where we formed the, the interface approach in building peaceful coexistence in our community. Since then, we have been working together as an interface entity to create awareness on different issues in the community, including land restoration. During the, the planting of the trees, we invite a Leica Trust through Mika initiative. We work with different stakeholders with, within the government, including the fisheries department, the Kenya forest, the Kenya wildlife services, the county and the national government. Thank you. Are there any questions? Zura and Halima can add something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariam. That was great. Zura or Halima? Please go ahead if you're ready. Well, thank I you. just want to thank you. Yes, I just want to thank Mariam so much for the great uh, representation she has done on behalf of uh, the Minda Trust. Uh, and I really liked the title of your presentation, Mkoko ni Uhai. Mkoko ni Uhai. Mkoko is, yes, it's mangrove a mangrove tree. tree yeah? It's the mangrove yes. tree, right. Yes. And so they work with the mangrove tree. They have done so for years and they're telling us that Mkoko ni Uhai. That's yes. amazing. Uh, just as an overview, um, the Minda Trust works actively to advocate for laws and policies that contribute towards land restoration. They work with religious leaders as well as some government entities and county governments. And I really want to highlight uh, something that really stood out. Uh, you pointed out a very nice uh, verse from the Quran, which is very using some very striking imagery, which says wide wide life uh, is an earthly heaven, a mirror to the lush paradise above. So really, if we look at it from this point of view, we have every reason to preserve it and hold it with high esteem and dignity and with the respect that this earth deserves. Okay, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, presentation. And we're going to move on now. I can see that um, 
on the screen, we have Jane Jelani's uh, screen. Is that right? Jane Jelani, you may go ahead. Yeah, my name is Reverend Jane Jelani. I'm the chairperson of Eleka Trust. And the Eleka Trust is a Christian-based uh, organization that, um, that partners with the, uh, with the Minda Trust in the area of planting tree as an interfaith initiative. And that's why we call ourselves Mika. That is a me for Minda, which in cost means uh, Shambas and Eleka as a trust that builds capacity. Yes, uh, Eleka Trust uh, started uh, in 1995. Our mission is to catalyze faith-based life transformation through leadership, training, and skills development. Our vision is that we have coastal communities living in abundance through faith-based transformation. And our one objective for conserving the environment is to improve the quality of life through sustainable lives, livelihood skills, and enhanced environmental conservation. Uh, that picture shows me talking about the role of religion to climate change actors in Mombasa during the International Day of Women. Our motivation to engage in restoration as mandated in the Christian holy book, the Bible, Genesis 2.15, mankind was placed in the garden, that is the earth, to tend and care for it. Through our registered HACID initiative, community-based organization responsible for Eleka Trust conserv conservancy efforts, we endeavor to fulfill this God-given mandate. We are of the view that Creation is connected to the earth and it can only thrive if earth thrives. God has entrusted the earth for us to protect and that land degradation and the unsustainable use of natural resources have consequences. We can also agree that land Restoration is a powerful way to improve livelihoods, for security, and resilience to the climate crisis we are facing now. Faith institutions are important development partners who mobilize, raise awareness, and inspire changes in behavior with great ease because we are trusted by communities. Some of our restoration activities include um, fruit and herbal tree seedling distribution and uh, planting in places of worship for children who then distribute to families. We have kitchen gardening using desalinated recycled water for women in Asal coastal communities. And uh, Mariam has already alluded to the mangrove tree planting for all. You can see that even five-year-olds in that picture are having a mangrove to plant. Religious leadership capacity building for landscape restoration. Faith communities uh, congregate daily, weekly, monthly at various meetings to which they come voluntarily. So places of worship are strategically placed to create awareness, uh, messages in sermons for sensitization, growing seed nurseries for distribution to congregants. Next, those are some of the pictures. You can see there are three year old planting a mangrove tree. And uh, the next one is, uh, the, the lady on that picture lives in Voy, and Voy is dry and packed, and she grows exotic indigenous tree seedlings in order to distribute to faith communities. Our challenges and opportunities, most places in urban settings don't have any space left, as most is used in buildings and concrete uh, walkways. The concept of desalinization, desalinizing wastewater from washing clothes and utensils is, has been taught and has taken root. Women group sensitization is important. Ashes are readily available as a resource to desalinization because what we do is we ask men, women to put 20 liters of dirty water where they use 
uh, they use one kilo of ash and leave it for 12 hours. Then use the same water to, to use in their kitchen gardens, which Mariam has already alluded to. Uh, then training religious leaders in restoration of degraded land in Asal regions of Kenya require resources. This partnership of financing and regreening among faith is yet to be realized. Nurturing nature and looking at planting trees as an act of worship is, is an opportunity that the church or faith-based institution can tap into. This is certainly, especially true in looking at trees as a peace building mechanism. Conflict in Africa is often due to resources from earth. Tree planting can, uh, can be a restoration of resources and that's providing security and restoring peace. Because we network, uh, when we started Mika Initiative in 2011, under the uh, mentorship of uh, Alan Chana and the two imams and imam and pastor from Nigeria, it was just about uh, resource-based conflict uh, in Kenya and in Africa. Lessons learned. The children are first learners in matters regreening by starting with three nurseries. Women's kitchen gardens using desalinated water, wastewater, contributes to green vegetable nutrition of food security in Asa regions. If well kept, it becomes a revenue source for the family. Women and youth groups are adapting to climate change efforts. Clergy are beginning to appreciate their role in restoring degraded landscape. And places of worship and other related in infrastructure can serve as tree nurseries, host training grounds, and spaces that promote environmental leadership. So we don't need to go to hotels or to go to big conference centers to have our training. We just do it at the places of worship. It can be the church, it can be the mosque, it can be the madrasa classes or the Sunday school classes in our churches. And we have capacity building. Uh, and the beauty of it is that uh, our congregants or faithfuls just come voluntarily for this training. Key messages. Restored landscape is a heritage for future generations. Climate change necessitates adaptations to use of desalinated rain harvest and irrigation or water to regreening. Religious leaders need to be sensitive to their God-given role in leading their congregations in the restoration of degraded land in Asa regions of Kenya. I'm thinking about Costa and Kitui area. And an, an envisioned future where clergy are at the heart of restoration of landscape in the Asa regions of Kenya. In turn, faithful regenerating using the FM and R and regreening residential spaces. The kind of support required to scale up land restoration. We need partnerships in financing capacity building in workshops for religious leaders. Also seed grants to women, youth groups, to grow tree nurseries for distribution. Uh, the picture that you're seeing there is uh, we, were, we were welcoming the incoming female Muslim faith-based uh, chair lady of NEMA. Her name is Lulu Safia. And so we did this by commemorating it by planting a tree at the Swahili port in Mombasa. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much, Reverend Jane Jilani. That was Reverend Jane Jilani with a very good presentation of the Aleka Trust, which started in 1995. They have told us about the leadership and the trainings and the skill development that they do. Their vision is to have coastal communities living in abundance. All this by addressing environmental, climate, and land restoration. Uh, she has also told us that we are entrusted by God to protect and care for the earth. She highlighted the value and importance of working with faith leaders and communities. And they have seen that this approach works because they are entrusted by the population. So it was very good to hear the, out, the outline of the restoration activities that Aleppo Trust has done in collaboration with many other groups as well in the community. And we do remember especially the photo of that little three-year-old planting a mangrove tree. 
So really, if a three-year-old is planting a tree, so can we all. Let's continue now with our following presentation. We have Olive Branch Mission, Bishop John Parrit. Bishop John Parrit, are you available? Yes, I am, I'm ready. Oh, okay, great, great. Welcome, Bishop John Parrit. And we're Thank happy you. to hear now from Olive Branch Mission, Haribu. Thank you, Katha. Uh, my name is uh, Bishop John Parrit. I'm from the Olive Branch Mission. Uh, we are a faith-based organization established in 1867, but uh, here in Kenya, we started in 2002. If you can give me the next screen. Uh, as a faith-based organization established in 1867, uh, the mission started in Chicago. You know, during the time, there was a lot of fire and people were going through crisis. And then that later on, we moved our programs to, to Kenya, to Africa. Uh, mostly focusing women empowerment, community resilience and drought mitigation program and conservation among others. We founded the Kimana Sanctuary in partnership with the Kimana community. This is a sanctuary based in, uh, in the Tok Tok area with, with 884 members. Uh, within the sanctuary, we were able to do a lot of conservation in terms of wildlife, in terms of uh, tree planting initiatives, in terms of water catchment and all that. Beside that also we partnered with uh, Loy Tok Tok Forest, uh, Greening Loy Tok Tok, and other organizations to plant trees within uh, Loy Tok Tok area. And also we have been uh, spearheading agroforestry initiative uh, by helping people to plant not only trees, but also trees that can provide uh, fruits uh, for people to be able to, uh, to sell the fruits and generate income for them and also for their families, and also to access the fruit for their own nutrition. We've done also a lot of water distribution, uh, sanitation program. Currently, we support, we, we have partnered with organization to dig boreholes uh, in Kimana areas and other places. Uh, we are supplying over 1,000 people uh, in Kimana area with water. We've done water filter distribution in various areas uh, within uh, Kajiado County and even uh, beyond. Next screen, please. Uh, this is just a picture of uh, one of our agroforestry initiatives, I took this picture just two days ago in one of our farms where we've been trying to tell people just to plant uh, fruits uh, and uh, also for their own food and also for conservation because then you have trees that can be able to provide food uh, cover and also, also food for the people. Uh, next please. Uh, is it possible to make it a little bit bigger? Yeah, so some of the uh, some some of our initiatives we want to, to create opportunities and employment uh, to develop through environmental conservation initiative initiatives. These are some of the things that you're trying to to do within. Uh, we, we've seen that with conservation you can create employment, and uh, you can also improve uh, uh, livelihood through uh, by ensuring there's food security, security, uh, resilience, and restoring uh, ecosystems. Uh, through agroforestry, tree planting. Uh, we also do a lot of indigenous tree because we realized that uh, the community here, they, 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 they don't plant, they, they like just planting trees, but also there's a, a very big initiative that we are trying to see. There are trees that are disappearing from the horizon and we're trying to encourage them to plant indigenous trees, to do uh, also restoration of community forest among others. We also advocate for tree planting and natural tree by individuals, community, public, and also private institutions, government agencies, among others. For example, we've done uh, trees with uh, uh, the police, we've done trees within the, the prisons, we've done trees in churches and even schools, those kind of things. We also want to increase uh, community engagement and go first through training and capacity building. Uh, we realize by training, and uh, a lot of people are able to understand that there is a lot of uh, benefit they can get through uh, uh, ag agroforestry and also that helps us to restore the, the environment. We also want to utilize, utilize available community resources to help them create resilience, employment and restoration of ecosystem. Uh, in our area here, we have a lot of land that has been lying idle. A good example was uh, the Kimana Sanctuary where we started uh, the sanctuary because we realized the land was lying idle. We talked to the community, we were able to 
see how we can do conservation and how that conservation can bring money to the community and provide for them in terms of meeting their daily needs. And that is working right now in a very big way. We also engage in an initiative that seeks to conserve water catchment areas and ensure sustainable provision of water to the community. Water is a key thing in terms of restoration. And we realize if we conserve water, then we can be able to make sure that we can plant trees, we can sustain communities. We also support, uh, support and collaborate with other organizations in, uh, in the achievement of our long-term transformation agenda. Uh, also, part of our agenda also is to promote environmental education, conservation in, and in education and religious institution. That's also one of our objectives that we've been trying to implement in this, uh, in this area. Next, please. Our mission uh, as Olive Branch, we are a Christ-centered strategic ministry. Uh, we are committed and engaged in life transformation, development, restoration of individuals, families, communities, and also very importantly, also ecosystems around the world. Uh, ecosystems in terms of uh, the natural environment and uh, the fauna and flora. Our vision as Olive Branch is to seek to inspire, uh, inspire hope life transformation, sustainability, and resilience to individuals, communities through its uh, various climate change initiatives. That's our vision statement. Next, please. Uh, why do we, uh, one of the things that has motivated us to engage in uh, motivation, uh, in restoration of the environment, is because we see that all regions agree that uh, the nature is an act of divinity and should be treated as such. Nature is divine. Uh, spiritual leaders at all levels are critical to the success of the global solidarity for an ethical, moral, spiritual commitment to protect the environment and God's creation. Uh, also, the leaders like us can engage in different uh, ways to ensure that they are on the forefront of restoration because people really look at their leaders to give them direction. What is also so profound for me is leading by the front, walking the talk, uh, leaders must be the role models in restoration to environment to ensure that they inspire change that can be emulated by those they serve. We also have to state that the world is grappling with the effect of climate change. First-hand experience, I have seen both wildlife, wild and domestic animals die out of biting drought. Uh, last week, I was just driving across different areas within our entire Loitok Tok, and we were counting thousands of wildlife dead, thousands of cows, is drought, the drought situation is very dire here. And so we decided to give water and food to the people. So a lot of people are going hungry right now. So uh, the congregants in our churches and our religious institution uh, in drought-stricken drought, drought areas fail to access spiritual nourishment because they don't come to our institution at this time of drought. At such time, you realize there is need for leaders to step up and provide the much needed hope. That's what we are doing. This is just an area of view of an area where, which is not far from where we are, it's some pet. This area used to be forested, but right now you can almost see there is barely not a single tree left. And next slide, please. A part of our restoration activities, uh, last year I spearheaded a massive tree planting exercise and we planted 120,000 trees in Kajaro South alone uh, through various initiatives with the go county government, with the other ministries like the government and institutions and all that, we're able to do all this planting. We have a nursery that we've been distribution, uh, distributing these trees from. We also partnership, uh, uh, through partnership with Greening Loitokto. Uh, that's an, one of the organizations that is doing a lot of tree planting within Loitokto. I'm a member of, and I'm a founder member. We have seen uh, since uh, set up uh, 20 seedbeds in different locations to nurture trees for distribution and within our communities. We also refer, uh, do reforestation with KWS in the Loitokto region. Uh, beside that, also reforestation initiative with the Loitokto prison staff and the Kimana one Sanctuary, one sanctuary one Wetlands. More one more minute, Bishop Wright. Very clear. It's just a picture of uh, last week we we're distributing water to a community that was seriously affected. Next slide. Uh, some of the, uh, we have also other restoration activities that I've mentioned. Uh, among others, we founded uh, other organizations, partnered with other organizations, schools, institutions, to start greening clubs with a focus, focus on planting and nurturing trees in those institutions. Next. Uh, this is just one uh, example of a farm that we've created where we are using drip irrigation and we're planting trees. 
as a source of enhancing uh, food security within this area. We're training people that you can use water uh, through irrigation to, to enhance food security as part of our initiative. Uh, next. Uh, we also done rivers, part of the restoration that we do, rivers and also uh, catchment areas like the Kimana Sanctuary and such. We've been doing a lot of restoration activities. Uh, next. Uh, some of the challenges, uh, as you can see there, the area is undergoing uh, a huge subdivision right now. And uh, the, the indigenous people have been subdividing their land. So that means the, the original areas that have been uh, forest are changing now to be uh, farming land. In the process, people are cutting down trees and that's really affecting uh, the, the, the conservation areas that we are doing right now. And otherwise, water, was, water is a big challenge right now. And also we have uh, uh, restoration uh, uh, programs are very labor and capital intensive. So funding is also a challenge right now. Next, please. Are some of the communities that we're working with uh, as a communities, as an area that is becoming less and less for wildlife, there's always going to be uh, a lot of conflict. You can see that picture there, the monkey telling us, uh, the man, I think we are supposed to be telling the monkey, but the man, monkey is telling us, beware. <laughs> Next. <laughs> some of the opportunities, there's a lot of uh, funding that uh, through climate change that we are realizing through other NGOs and the government. We're also planting of plant, uh, food trees, create restoration activities. Also the restoration efforts have opened new opportunities for employment uh, to the locals and uh, through our nurseries and sanctuary among others. Hi, also we have a lot of indiv individuals that are embracing planting of trees. The last one. That's some of the lessons that you've learned uh, and uh, the key messages that you want to pass to you. When you plant a tree, you plant hope. Climate change is real and it's happening right now among others. Next please. Uh, that's a picture that's very important. We need to take care of people and the wildlife and our environment, very critical to our nature and our restoration effort. Next. Thank you. Uh, I think as we are saying there, he who plants a tree, plants hope. Thank you very much. And I'm so happy to be in this forum. God bless you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bishop uh, Marit, for your presentation and for telling us about the Olive Branch mission. Uh, I'm sure many of us have not known about it before. It's actually a very old organization with roots way back in 1867 in the US. And really I want to commend you especially for highlighting the current drought situation in the country. Here we are faith communities, faith leaders, faith actors, and there's a drought in our own country. So thank you so much for bringing that up and to show and also for showing us what you guys have been doing practically with the people affected at the moment in this drought. Thanks for that. We're now going to proceed. We're trying to rush a little bit because of time. We want to end on time, but we also want to include all the panelists that are here on board. We're going to move on now to our next presentation. We have the Green Anglicans. David Odembo, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you so much. Asante Karibu. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great opportunity. I'm David Odembo from the Western part of Kenya, specifically Anglican champion, the Anglican champion, restoration, and of course, the issue of the involvement of faith-based organization in landscape restoration in Kenya. You're most welcome. So basically, Green Anglican is an organization that started in South Africa, actually with uh, a global concept of uh, the whole Anglican religion. Basically, uh, Kenya was the third province to actually adapt this, and Mias happened to be the second in the year 2018 that we adopted the Green Anglican. And the mission is to strive and to, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain the renewal of earth. And of course, the vision is to preserve God's creation for the future generation. This is actually based on the theme in Genesis, that is uh, the, the first chapter of Genesis, whereby we are given uh, green plants for food, basically. That is what we are trying to promote. And uh, as you can see, we are engaging youth, among others, to help us do that. Next, please. So basically, the objective is, uh, we have many objectives, but uh, basically, 
tree planting is one of them, but we are actually promoting responsible management of the environment, uh, the encouraging of use of forest and farm management, and of course, the Anglican response and productive for the beneficial interaction with the environment. And then, of course, we are also promoting the adaptation of clean, clean and affordable renewable energy. These things like biogas, among others, and then, of course, promote justice in Kenya and the world in terms of climate change. And then, of course, just to provide, uh, a cons to conserve God's creation in, in the environment that we have been given, and especially in the Western region of Kenya. So what motivation do we have in terms of restoration? We find that we are God's people, and uh, we are passionate about care of the environment as it's a call that we have been told to do, especially in the book of Genesis, but also this is to demonstrate the different approach that we are advocating for, and this is the farm, farming God's way, and this is actually promoting things like organic farming, which are milestones that we actually uh, really passionate about through our Anglican Development Services, which has branches all over Kenya, and this is actually one of the pioneer things that you're doing. And then, of course, the other motivation is the unfortunate things that are happening as a result of human activity that are contributing to unsustainable utilization of resources and hence destruction of mother nature. And this, of course, having diverse effect to the whole globe as we're speaking. So basically, the SEK of Anglican Church developed a strategy to try and Streamline the climate change and disaster risk reduction that are that led to the launch of Green Anglican Movement, and you will find that in the forty around forty bishops that we have, each and every bishop is actually the Green Ambassador of what we are calling Green Anglican Movement. And then, of course, us as congregants, we are actually there to help sustain this movement by actually embracing what we are being taught to do uh, as envisioned in the objective. Next, please. So what are we doing? As you can see in the picture just next to us, this is what was actually the time of Corona, that is 2020, when we were launching the tree planting for that particular year. And you can see those are Sunday school children and uh, our Sunday school coordinator actually planting a tree and uh, as we speak, the tree is actually now almost two years and it has grown very well. And next to them is our bishop, who is actually the key ambassador. But we are saying that we are not only planting trees, we are planting to nurture trees for them to grow. So we plant with a mark that that child who's planted the tree will come back and say, this is what I planted and it has grown. And then, of course, we're also doing things in regards to collection and recycling. We normally do cleanups and then of course, promotion of green energy. We are talking about biogas and then we are talking about energy efficient decoys among other things and even stoves that are actually using little amount of uh, firewood. And then of course, we are also promoting green gardening and seedlings. And then of course, climate, smart enterprises, this is actually embracing blue economy because here in Western Kenya, we have a lot of rains and a lot of water. So we are thinking about being smart in, in ensuring that we actually do some enterprising on them. And then of course, we are promoting also uh, entertainment centers and sport areas. These are areas that we segregate, especially in the area where we have an arboretum where people can come and camp and also just enjoy nature as they're doing it. And then of course, we're also promoting the use of open restaurants. These are open areas that we set aside to be in areas that you can enjoy nature, but also be able to do something in tandem with nature so that you don't destroy it, but use it to propel our activities. Next, please. So what are some of the challenges that we are facing? We find that there are different things that we are facing and especially in our approach of promoting fruit trees and indigenous trees, 
the cost is very high and you'll find that the cost of an indigenous shillings a piece, but the exotic shillings. So people embrace the, the, the exotic trees rather than the indigenous trees. And then of course, we're also looking at job creation. You'll find that the activity has resulted up to us being able to get some job opportunities and especially in terms of uh, helping us grow the concept of Green Anglican Movement. Then the whole work is labor intensive because in nurturing trees for around two years, we have actually been engaging um, watering, like daily watering of the trees to nurture them. So it's very labor intensive. Then there's been slow adaptation in replication because when we started, we thought of doing it at the diocesan level and then to cascade it into the level that you are able to read the congregation in the in the parishes, but we are now doing it by a, a pioneering this project for the youth, and this has enabled us to actually beat that particular challenge. And then, of course, there is slow growth rate of indigenous trees. They grow very slowly, and hence that is also a challenge that we are facing. But we are happy to say that we have been able to engage children, youth, and teens, which are actually bringing in a new energy in terms of this project going forward. And as you will attest, is like they are the next generation that will bring it out very closely. And you can remember when we are starting off, we are saying that we are promoting the planting of the number of trees based on the number of years you live. Uh, the, during bad days, and then of course annually we have November as our year or, 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 or our month where we actually promote the planting of trees as a diocese and using the youth as the backbone of this particular activity. And then of course the other opportunity you are seeing is the holistic ecolo ecological transformation that is happening. We have an arboretum and we have just opened it the, uh, last week and we are seeing that with an opportunity that people can come and learn about the indigenous trees and their importance, and this will actually support this. Of course, you realize that there are certain things that we are learning in that we have our diocesan headquarters as the showcase, and people come and say that there's been change in terms of air and also that the setup. And you know, this is actually not only affecting this microenvironment, but also this region whereby we are we are not polluting rivers and lakes and of course even to the seas then of course here we are saying the rains are raining and even yesterday the whole of this week have been experiencing a lot of rain basically which is out of the norm but we appreciate because it is now a uh, amount of rainfall that we are receiving is robust for our crop growing and all, of course a robust harvest that we'll be having and then of course the unpolluted soils are healthy for our food. And uh, as you can see in our arboretum, we're actually integrating the trees and also promoting the planting of vegetables. And these are actually some of the key things that are promoting food to come closer to tree planting, but also get some food out of it. And then there's the good health of our forest. And then of course, removing the greenhouse effect. Then there's income generation because we have been we have been enabled to, to get up. some Maybe some income in terms of just selling trees from our industry. It has actually promoted our visibility in terms of uh, of promoting indigenous trees, and then of course the availability of water resources and even grass because we are actually encouraging the animals, and then of course also promoting the apiary approach whereby we are rearing beehives among others to try and synergize all those activities. And then of course this food security is making us actually do this is a holistic ministry that is actually not only for us, but also for the whole nation as Kenya and also a region of Mumias as we are speaking. So what are the key things that you are learning? You find that uh, we are engaging uh, departments and these actually the youth I'm department, here. children's department. We actually have the women ministry and the main ministry that actually engaged in bringing the earth. And then of course we have our development arm, which is the Anglican Development Services, both in the Western region and Kenya, they have been a key pillar in terms of just 
highlighting what she are doing, but also participating in building up the Twina Sari and the world. And of course, these are great benefits not only to the congregants in Mumias, but also the Kenya as large and even the world. And then, of course, the repercussions of not trying our best will be catastrophic. And then we see that this is an opportunity for us to do things in a small way. I can picture what I've done for myself basically after Green Anglican. This year, I was able to plant almost around 80 tree we call them Luciola or they are called Nile Tuplin. And we are, I was able to plant these and even grow some, some of the fruit trees, which are actually key in terms of just growing fruit trees, which actually enable me to actually do something that I've learned from the church and do it at home where I'm living. And then of course the Anglican decade theme, which is a holistic, ecological approach, which is an important part or will play an integral part in not only the ministry of the church, but also the whole some transformation of the nation Kenya. I think that is what I had for you and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, David Odembo. That was a great presentation. Mostly I must thank you for inspiring us with uh, telling us about the planting of 80 trees. That, that's not a small feat. Congrats on that, and uh, I want many to follow to follow your steps on that. Asante Sana. Yes. So uh, we've heard uh, quite a few things from what the Green Anglicans are doing. They work to safeguard the integrity of the environment and the earth, and they encourage good farming and promote climate justice in Kenya and around the world. And they also have something they promote called Farming God's Way and they also do organic farming. Thank you very much. We're going to carry on now with the next presentation. Uh, this presentation is from Ms. Ruth Kitahi of World Vision. They have a very innovative and interesting uh, program that they do called Empowered World View. Uh, this program is a syllabus which actually helps people to become enabled from their core, from their mind and their hearts. And we have actually partnered with them, with my organization, Oiko Diplomatique, and we have encouraged people and shown them how they can actually be self-sufficient from very little resources. Because after all, the resources are all around. We just don't see it. So I want to uh, welcome Ruth Kitahi now to tell us more about what this is about, the Empowered Worldview. Karibu, Ruth Kitahi. Thank you very much. Uh, please confirm that you can hear me, Nkata. Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'll, I'll go ahead to talk about Empowered Worldview, but before I do that, allow me to talk briefly about World Vision. Um, World Vision is an international partnership of Christians, and our mission is to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in working with the poor and the oppressed to, uh, to promote human transformation, seek justice, and bear witness to the good news of the kingdom of God. So basically that is what we exist to do. And we are a child focused organization. And therefore our mission, um, our vision is for every child life in all its fullness. And our prayer for every heart is the will to make it so. Um, so really life in abundance is uh, for children uh, is, is, is also what we exist for. And uh, uh, we have six core values. We are Christian. Uh, we are Christian, we are committed to the poor, we value people, we are stewards, we are partners, and we are responsive. So those are the things that, uh, that guide us uh, as we do our work. Before I continue, I want to acknowledge that I am with uh, Daniel, Dr. Daniel Mubengi. Um, he's, he's also my manager, and he... It has been very, very instrumental in development of Empowered Worldview, which I'll be talking about. So I'm glad that we have a number of people on this call who have been trained on Empowered Worldview. I was glad to hear Nkada talk about it briefly. And just to know that there are many, many people who, are, um, who, uh, who understand this, this um, curriculum and this approach and who can actually continue to support the work. So Empowered Worldview is a, a faith-based empowerment approach. 
and it encourages individuals and communities to examine their beliefs, their mindsets and be, be, uh, behaviors in, in light of the scripture and God's plan. I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, World Vision is a, is a faith-based organization and we need to be able to do development differently by bringing on board um, the faith aspects, which are usually uh, a lot of times um, ignored uh, by different organizations, uh, community development organizations, as well as uh, donors. So for us, Empowered Worldview has been a very uh, innovative way of helping us to integrate faith in development. And basically what Empowered Worldview is about, it, it helps us to look at the scriptures and look at the issues that surround us, whether they are issues of poverty, and start to examine our lives in light of the scripture and ask ourselves, where, where, has the, where is the departure? And a lot of times we realize that, and, and we actually realize that um, poverty is really a, a spiritual issue. And as we look at scriptures, we are able to see where we have, um, we have gone wrong. And a lot of time it has to do with beliefs that are not necessarily um, true, true beliefs. They are, uh, most of the times they are cultural um, and, and, and we also find mindsets and behaviors and practices that are not in line with the scripture. And therefore, as we have those, that kind of dialogue, we are able to really um, seek ways of, of go going back to the plan of God. Basically, that is what Empowered Worldview is about. It emphasizes some elements, um, for example, issues around identity, the identity of the participants or the people that we are, we, we, we are working with. Um, we, we seek to restore dignity. We know that poverty is a very uh, uh, undignifying um, thing. And we also help to see the people, the so-called poor as the agents of their own development. That development is not necessarily going to come from elsewhere, but they have to be the agents that will bring about their development. So issues around um, identity, dignity, and agency are things that we really capitalize on. The, the, we usually undertake a training on the empowered worldview, and this takes a cascading approach. Basically, first of all, reaching out to the very influential people, including faith leaders. And then from there, they are able to reach uh, community influencers who are able to reach um, individuals. So basically, that is how we undertake or we roll out empowered worldview in communities. So I know there are many who have not been part of this training in this call. And just to summarize what Empowered Worldview is about, uh, we actually have an image of a house as we, as, as, as we think about Empowered Worldview. And there are key things that we normally focus on. Um, so we have the foundations that, uh, upon which we build all our discussion. Number one, um, Empowered Worldview em employs faith reflection. As I talked about earlier, it's a faith-based approach. So we use a lot of reflection on the, on the scriptures. It also focuses on the local assets. I mentioned that we emphasize the agency of the community or the, uh, or the participants in their own development. And therefore we help them to see or to explore what uh, assets are already at their disposal, what is already in their communities. And then we emphasize a lot on working in communities um, to be, and, and, or working in togetherness to be able to bring about um, changes that are meaningful. And then also the role of relationships, working in relationships. And, and those are the foundations upon which we lay um, the, 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 the approach. And then we have some five key pillars. We talk a lot about identity because we believe very strongly that um, poverty has a lot to do with marred identity or where people really have lost their sense of identity. And, and therefore we use, we especially you make use, use of Genesis chapter one to talk about our identity. We talk about vision and help the participants to come with their own personal visions as well as community vision. We talk about the role of compassion and relationship. And I remember at one point uh, where we were having a discussion around environment and somebody helped us to know that you can actually have compassion for the environment. They were helping us to know that actually 
uh, even trees, they have emotions, you know, and, and uh, actually even the scriptures talk about the, 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 the creation groaning. And therefore we, we start realizing that we need to deal with the environment with compassion. We talk about relationship, and at the end of the workshop, uh, we really uh, have to come out of there with an action plan uh, to be able to do what it is that we have agreed during the workshop. So basically that is how the, the, the training uh, takes place. And then the rest of the work is really to follow up and, and support um, the participants to ensure that they are following through with their actions. I, uh, I would like to, I mentioned earlier that um, Empowered Worldview is a faith-based approach. It was developed with a Christian perspective or from a Christian perspective, and it has continued. Actually, it has been um, adapted to other faith. But basically, uh, when we talk about, uh, when we, we go through Empowered Worldview um, from a Christian perspective, I have mentioned that we, we focus on Genesis chapter one. And when we are talking about environmental or faith-based land restoration, Genesis chapter one is still very instrumental. For example, we reflect on, you know, the fact that the creation was made or created by God and he said, let there be. And then the question, then we start asking ourselves, what should then be the role of man who has been made in the image of God as far as uh, in vegetation or, or trees are concerned? Then we also reflect on the fact that when when man was created, um, he was given plants or trees for sustenance, for food. And, and this also triggers a lot of reflection about the issue of food security. Because we can see here that um, first God created the vegetation, he also made man. He also gave humanity plants for food. And we have done what we've done to the environment and we find ourselves in a situation where we are now food insecure. So what should be the right approach should be in regard to this? Is it to pray or to do something about the environment that we have, we have so, um, we were to rely on for food, which we have destroyed. And then we also reflect on the fact that we, we have been mandated and the first, and actually the, the um, tilling and taking care of the land was among the first commandments that God gave man. So again, what should be our role be? And then we also reflect on other scriptures, uh, both in the Old and New Testament that talk about creation. We also reflect a lot on the local assets um, and, and people are able to see that actually trees are among the most uh, uh, available uh, resources that things that we already um, have, have access to. How can we harness those? For the for the well-being, for our own well-being, when we do root cause analysis, uh, which is part of the uh, empowered worldview training, we see a very close relationship between poverty and land de degradation, and therefore, when we develop action plans that have been are based on that uh, problem analysis, we have to ensure that we are including um, actions that have to do with environmental restoration. So where environment um, and, and land-based environment, I mean, uh, restoration is concerned, these are some of the reflections that, that we hold in the Empowered World View workshop. So One a lot yes, uh, uh, a bit of work has been done um, on, on land restoration. I'm glad to see uh, Bishop Parat on this call. We've worked very closely with Lemayan, who is one of his followers in the regreening or uh, um, uh, in, in initiative. And we have a story here that I'm not going to open, but basically they are doing great work in terms of the regreening, including, for example, using, um, you know, um, doing land restoration around barriers where, you know, in celebrating the, the lives of the people, if somebody was 50 years, they plant 50 trees. And I think these are some of the things that we can also borrow. We have also done some work in El Geo Marakwet, working with Major Sei and his community. We started an initiative of, of uh, land restoration of, of Keio Valley. And um, um, as I mentioned here, quite a number of people, our participants have been trained um, so that we can move together um, using you know, this, this approach. Uh, lastly, um, what are some of the um, opportunities moving forward? 
One, we are looking at an opportunity of integrating Empowered Worldview with FMNR. FMNR is very, very successful, but once we bring on board the scriptures or, or faith reflections, I think it's going to be very, very successful. Because one of the things we have learned is when it comes from the pulpit, it gets done. But the other thing that we have seen is that a lot of people did not see, including um, pastors and, and bishops and other faith leaders did not see environmental protection as their mandate. They thought it's for um, uh, scientists and environmentalists, but when we go through this and they, they see their mandate, they actually do it. Um, so the other thing we are also looking at is you know, doing it in multi-faith context, going beyond the Christian reflections to other faiths. One of the things we've been, we've seen is a part world view being very well adapted in West Africa, as well as India, and also recognizing that environmental conservation is actually promoted by all major world religions. And the question is what kind of dialogues are we, uh, can we have to, so that we can move together um, to, uh, as faith-based um, groups? So basically those are some of the opportunities that we are looking at going ahead and I will stop there and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asante Sana Ruth Kitahi. That was a very good overview of the training that Empowered Worldview does. I'd really encourage anyone here who is interested in knowing more about how to, to be able to do your uh, activities without looking outside too much, uh, for resources, uh, contact World Vision, uh, the e Empowered Worldview program. Uh, they can really help to mobilize and to empower people. Uh, next, we are now uh, almost towards the tail end of the program. We have heard lots and lots of uh, presentations. We have heard practical activities being done. We have heard about the genesis of how uh, faith communities have come together in a structured man manner. Let's move on to the plenary sessions. And I would like to call on Halima and Laura, if you can now take over in the plenary. And we're going to look at the question of what is the way forward with promoting and integrating a faith-based approach to restoration in Kenya. Halima, are you available? Laura, I can see you're on now. Yeah. Yeah, Halima is not around. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Laura, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Nkatha. And I'd like to thank all our speakers for sharing with us the lovely work that they're doing and the opportunities they see, the future that they envision moving forward. It's been really inspiring to learn from that. So we'll move on right next to the plan uh, panel. And in this panel, like Nkatha has said, that we're going to be talking about um, uh, how, what's the way forward? We have seen this, uh, this is what faith communities are doing. We have seen these uh, are the challenges, these are the opportunities, this is the support that they require. So what's next? How can we move on? Because their faith-based approach has a greater, has a great potential. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have joining us today, three amazing panelists. We were supposed to have one, but one has another one, but he has not managed to join. So um, that is Sheikh Ibrahim Lethome. But with us, we have Madame Sujata, uh, Dr. Alan Chana, and Ms. Mika Bono Cheng. And they are going to provide different perspectives. Madame Sujata will provide a perspective from as a faith leader. Uh, Dr. Alan will provide it from a perspective of someone who has been implementing various activities with faith groups and faith communities in Africa. So, and Miss, Miss Mika Bon Ocheng, who's going to be talking about it from a, a, a perspective of a researcher and who has been engaging in a faith-based approach. So welcome to everyone. So I'll start with um, Madam Sujata. If we can all turn on our cameras, all the different panelists who are here. Um, so we'll start with uh, Madam Sujata, who is, if I can just give a brief introduction. She is currently the chair of Chair Lady of Environment and Climate Change Commission at the Interreligious Inter Council of Kenya, where she's an executive member as well. 
She's the National General Secretary uh, since two eight of the Hindu Council of Kenya, and she was appointed by the president to be a member of the Interfaith Council to address the reopening of faith uh, worship places after the COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, Madam Sujata, if you're there. Yes, Laura. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Um, I just want to pose to you several questions. And first of all, being, you know, we have heard from the perspective of Christians, from Muslims. So we just want to know, as a representative from the Hindu Council of Kenya, could you please share with us a few examples of some of the restoration initiatives that you have engaged in as a community and how Hinduism supports restoration? And then you could also share about how you describe, you know, we have been talking about faith-based approach to restoration. So can you also just touch on how effective and influential such approaches could be? Yeah, thank you, Laura. And um, let me greet in our Hindu way, namaste, namaste to all. And uh, very good presentations with the Muslims and the Christians as Hindus also. We, Are you we, able to turn on your video, Madam Sujata? I'm just worried about the... <laughs> oh, the boundary. Uh, no and I can put my video on. Okay. No you know, as Hindus, we are strong believers of the nature. And the Hindus, we participate in any activity related to, to improving the Mother Earth and the nature. Landscape restoration is one of the activity. Some of the examples we do, as a Hindu council, we, have, uh, we are the umbrella body for 170 institutions all over the Kenya. But any, any organizations we have for this environment and climate change, we have a wing to protect our, uh, our environment. Any function is there, any activity is there, we'll start with the tree plantation. Even recently in Hindu Council, we done because of our Diwali, we have done big mega donation drive and the Hindu prayers. That time for the each guest, we gave two seedlings to plant them and nurture them and to grow them. So any activity then will go to the schools. We give them mostly fruit seedlings because the school, we give the, the students take the responsibility to to grow, to plant and grow and nurture the tree plantation so that we are giving the responsibility to the students. And also what we do, we say it is uh, protecting the environment is the dharma. If I, if I translate in English, it is a duty. Dharma means duty to protect, the, protect our environment. And we say the earth is as a goddess and to protect and goddess and is also as a mother. So the mother deserves our devotion and protection. So many Hindu rituals, women benefit from the earth and offer the gratitude and protection is our res response. Many Hindus, they touch the floor before getting out of the bed every morning and ask the mother to forgive them for trampling on her body. That about the, uh, Hinduism to protect our earth. So we, we believe that with the whole world is one family, we say Vasudevaka Kutumbakam. So we have only one earth, one sun, and one moon, and one human race. As a responsible human beings, we are intelligent. It is our collective responsibility. Irrespective of faith, we follow, we must all focus our efforts and energies in restoring of the forest and the landscape. Every faith-based organizations should do their part of supporting and encouraging the land restoration and forestation. Thank you, Lara. Uh, you're very welcome, Madam Sujat. I think just to add on that, um, I think we'd really like to know um, now how effective you think such kind of approaches could be. And also based on your experience now, working in the Interreligious Council of Kenya, what do you think, or maybe you could, yeah, what do you think actors who need to understand about faith communities before approaching them? Because here we have our audiences made up of people from various sectors. They're not only faith community. Of course, yes, they're, they belong to various faith congregants or faith communities, but they, they, we have researchers, we have public, uh, uh, 
uh, civil servants, people working for the public sector, and they might really have been impressed by the work that various communities are doing so that they would, I think it's important for them to understand what do they need to do? Uh, what do they need to understand about faith communities before approaching them to collaborate on restoration? And how do you think is the best way for them to do that? You know, a lot of, if you see our country now, presently, we are having the severe drought. Why this drought is happening is one of the main reason is the deforestation. Why deforestation is happening? And, you know, we just sell the charcoal, how the charcoal is coming. So the awareness, we should, we should give that awareness. You know, if you cut the tree, for only for the simple charcoal. What is happening? Now the drought and you know unexpected rains, unexpected cold, you know the climate is changing. Why? You know that awareness we should give all the religious bodies in the inter-religious council we do. We conduct many webinars to give awareness to the, to the people. Now the people they just they want to burn this taka taka and they put some plastic also there. And they're burning that gases are very, very dangerous to the human bodies. So this awareness we have to create. This drought, we are, we are, you know, many animals also dying. There is no water. Why? So that awareness we have to create. And it is our minimum responsibility to protect our mother earth. How? So how the water, even the plastic, you can see the rivers. And everywhere this, this is the plastic. Uh, the, the wastage is there, and even even this e wastage nowadays. You know, the, we we buy this the laptops, computers, even these phones. We change, and the cables will just throw it. What is happening? So the e wastage with the e wastage, we can generate some employment to the youth. We can use this e waste into useful products. These are the things we have to do it and give the awareness to each from the schools. From the three years, I saw this one presentation, three years boy is planting a tree to give that responsibility to the each citizen. They should understand why it is happening, why the drought. This is the beautiful country. Now this severe drought is we are facing. And now we can see everywhere now, arboretum, now I don't know, from few years, we just see the concrete forest there. Arboretum will maybe disappear. And Karura forest is, is slowly, slowly without for, for the small charcoal. We are using the big trees. And, and so much of the protection to, we, with the, to the trees are giving us, even the oxygen. We are getting the so much of oxygen from the trees. Everything is disappearing. So you have to give this information to the, our citizens. The awareness, maybe they don't know, they're just cutting the tree for the charcoal. Maybe they're just throwing the plastic. So they don't know. So the, the buildings, the, the buildings are coming, how the buildings are coming, why they're cutting the trees. This, this, the, the, our responsibility to teach them, even when we go to the religious places, they should talk about these things. They are very important. These things are many people, they don't know the small children, just they throw that, uh, the whatever we are not using these mobiles, they're just throwing it. So why it is happening, the drought is why it is happening. They should understand deep the root causes of these things. People should understand. And the water, even, even it is a small, even at home, the water we are just wasting. And we wash every day the clothes. There is no need to wash the clothes every day. That you know, the use the soap, it is very dangerous to the soil and the gases. You can use maybe after every three days or every one week. And the water we are using, the kitchen water, we can put it in the garden, rain harvesting. In the schools, we have to teach them rain harvesting. The people, they don't know the rain comes, where are the, we are catching points are there, the water. So much of the, when rain comes, we don't know how to, how to uh, harvest that water. These things we have to tell, only not only planting and growing and nurturing them. So everything we have to do it, even because, because this country, 85% or maybe 90% are the religious, uh, uh, religious people. We should only the religious leaders to come, come forward and tell them these are very important things. Even, you know, the fossil fuel, we have to use the cow dung. Cow dung, we, instead of the wood, wood fire, we can use the cow dung. How to use the waste management, everything we have to come and tell these things. 
as Laura. Maybe I'm a bit emotional. I'm sorry. No, it's it's perfectly okay because this is quite a serious issue, and unless we take it seriously, then we'll have no change. So thank you so much, Madam Sujata, for sharing with us the work that the Hindu Council is doing, for sharing with us how we can actually engage in now promoting the message of restoration within the faith communities in the various maybe the meetings that they have and so on. And I just like to add that I've seen a comment in the chat where they've said that as the Hindu Council of Kenya, you've done tree planting twice a year since 2005 and you've planted more than 187,000 seedlings, which yes, 92% every, of every, you know, any, yeah. every Diwali comes, every activity we do, every festival okay. we do the tree plantation, we have the wing of uh, the environment and climate change. So we do it, the 170 organizations, we do the tree plantation, we are very active in the tree plantation, okay. all over the Kenya. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Sujata. You are so, Thank you so much for your input. So we'll now move on to Sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim, who has been able to join the panel. Uh, Sheikh Ibrahim, can you hear us? Are you yes, able to unmute yourself? Yes, yes, I can hear you loud and clear. I hope you're hearing me all the way from the island of Zanzibar. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So can you, are you able to turn on your camera so that people can see you? Uh, yeah, it's saying I'm not allowed. You say you can't ah. start your because the host okay, has okay. stopped it. It is okay. from your end, Laura. You can do it from your end. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. But yes, sure. But thank you so much for creating the time to join us despite your uh, being quite far away. Um, I think you can be able to change, but uh, to turn your video on, but in case uh, I'm not able to do that from my end, but I think we can move on in the interest of time. Okay. Um, I just wanted to um, by, get your opinion. Oh, yes, I've, I've not introduced you. Sorry about oh. that. So, mm -hmm. um, Sheikh uh, Ibrahim Let Letome Asmani is a Secretary General of the Sustainable Conflict Resolution Center General, yes, Center for Sustainable Conflict Resolution. The legal, he's a legal advisor to the Supreme Council of Kenya a member of the Jamia Mosque Nairobi and the, and the chair of Brave Building Resilience Against Violence Extremism Reference Committee, which is a Muslim interfaith movement to counter religious narratives used to radicalize youth and violent extremism. He's also a member of the Inter-Religious Council of Kenya and a board member of the Green Faith Movement, which is an international faith-based organization that uses religion to advocate for the protection of our environment. So, um, Sheikh, uh, could you kindly uh, just let us know about what, in your opinion, what do you think is the best way of integrating restoration in now what the Islamic community is doing, even what other communities are doing, faith communities are doing, and what do you think? You know, we're, we're here talking about how we can transfer knowledge to faith communities, and Madam Sujata mentioned how people are doing webinars. Do you have other ideas on now, what's the best? You know, some people may not have access to maybe internet or they're not really conversant with technologies, but what do you think is the best way of sharing knowledge and restoration with faith communities? So those are two questions. What do you think is the best of integrating restoration in your communities, that's the Islamic communities <laughs> activities, and what do you think is the best of sharing knowledge and restoration with faith communities yeah. in general? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, um, for me, I am a believer of the fact that religion is not just about preparing ourselves to go to heaven. Religion is also about playing our rightful role in this world, make this world a better place like God expected us to do before we go to heaven. So in short, what we need to do is first of all, remember that we have a duty. God Almighty created us. God Almighty created all what is in this world and gave us the responsibility of being the steward just saying yes. that what we need to do is to remind people that religion is not just about going to heaven, but also, and I believe because having been a member of the interfaith a group that deals with the environment under the able chairmanship of Madam Sujata, what we tell people is that uh, we have a duty as religious communities, uh, and this is a, a, a godly and a spiritual responsibility of making sure that we are the stewards of the environment, God Almighty has created this world 
and given us the responsibility. I keep on reminding my fellow Muslims that in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 30, God Almighty says, telling the angels, I have created on earth I, I, the human being and I've made him my vicegerent, my steward, my representative on earth to make this world a better place. So for me, what we need to do is to mainstream protection of the environment in our religious teachings, because it, that is how it is supposed to be. So we have all these platforms, the religious platform that, that we have places of worship and other religious institutions. What we need to do as we prepare people, we keep on talking to people about worship, prepare yourself to go to a better place, a good place in heaven. We need to tell them that you can only earn that place if you play your rightful role in this world, which includes ensuring that we use uh, what God has given us, the resources that God has given us, we use them in accordance with the teachings of the religion. And this cuts across all the religions. When, I'm in, uh, I, uh, when I am uh, participating in an, interfaith, in an interfaith forum, talking about the environment, the question I pose, Laura, is this. When you look at the tree outside where you are now, is that tree a Christian tree? Is it a Muslim? Is it a Hindu? And the answer that you'll get is that that tree is just a tree created by God Almighty to serve humanity. And all of us have a duty to protect that, to protect the, the environment. And some of the things that, that, some of the problems that we are encountering as human beings is because of what we are doing as human beings. In the Quran, we are told, that corruption has become apparent in the sea and on land because of what we have done with our own hands. So we need to reverse that by uh, encouraging people that restoring the environment, protecting the environment is part of worship. Like in Islam, we are told a person is cast who pollutes a water mass or goes to relieve themselves in a place where people are uh, walking or even uh, moving, uh, where people are using as a place to rest the rest. We are also told that planting a tree from which either an animal will feed or a bird will feed, then, or a human being will feed on it or sit under its shade, then that is considered as an act of charity in Islam. It's considered as an act of charity. So for me, we just need to mainstream protection of the environment in our daily preachings in our mosques. The way through which you can communicate because as you said, we need to appreciate there are limitations. When you talk about um, using the webinar and the rest, there are people who are limited to that. So how can we convey this information to the faith communities? For me, it is first of all, building the capacity of the faith leaders, because these are the credible voices that the faith communities listen to. We need to build their capacity and also ride on the available platforms that are there. Like for the Muslims, we have the most, for the Christian, we have the churches. For the Hindus, we have the, the temples and other places. So we can use that. We also have media houses that are owned by faith communities. We can use those faith um, media houses or media platforms through which we can reach to a large number of faith communities that listen to them. So for me, that is all I would like to say now, unless maybe Laura, you want further clarification or further explanation. Thank you. No, I, I think you have really covered everything quite clearly and very simply. And it's really, um, and it was really good just hearing your ideas on how you think we can now move it forward and integrate it better. Because um, like you said, a tree outside my window is not Christian or Muslim. So maybe we should now, it's, it's all our responsibility. So we should all engage in it despite the various faiths that we come from. So thank you so much, Sheikh, for joining us. I know you have a quite busy schedule. You mentioned that you're facilitating a training in Zanzibar. So thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your insights on how, uh, how we can integrate it better, leveraging on the faith leaders, building their capacity, and now going to the churches, to the mosques, to the various religious um where the various religions or various faiths meet. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank so you, Laura, and allow me now to move away. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Um, so we have our last, our second last panelists. That is Dr. Alan Chana. Uh, Dr. Alan Chana is, uh, I would 
I think he describes himself. I think the best way to describe him is that he's a, um, an environment peace building and communication specialist. And he's the co-director of the Summer Academy on Climate, Land and Security, which is a collaboration between the Geneva Center for Security Policy Initiatives of Change Switzerland and Triple Capital. So he has experience working with various faith communities in various contexts and also with uh, several international organizations such as ICRAF, Global Level Greening Alliance and UNDP. So welcome, Alan. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, thank you so much. What an amazing uh, webinar we've had today. Anyway, I think you have a question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you too. Thank you for joining and taking part in the organization. So um, Alan, you know, you have a lot of experience in implementing faith-based approaches for various purposes, such as peace for conflicts, conflict resolution, and also that includes environmental stewardship and now in this case, landscape restoration. So what insights can you share with us on the subject of uh, faith-based approaches to landscape restoration? What does someone need to have in mind before they embark on such an approach? And what, how can they integrate such kind of an approach when they're working on landscape restoration? I, I think, I mean, the webinar today is evidence of the incredible richness you know, the energy, the commitment, the vision, the community reach and the moral influence of, of faith communities. Um, I think it was Ruth Gitahi summed it up in when she said, you know, life in abundance is what we exist for. And, you know, um, Anthony Blaze was saying, uh, we have to choose restoration. I mean, you know, communities that are saying this, it's very powerful. And when, like with this, uh, link up here with ICRAF and Regreening Africa and the restoration scientific community in a synergy, it becomes a very, very powerful uh, influence uh, to safeguard our world, you know, um, and, and quite a responsibility. Uh, but I think with that, uh, they say that, uh, you know, with that power <laughs> comes responsibility. I think as, as, and there are emotive things going on here. I mean, David uh, from Sinessa pointed out how emotive land is in itself. Land issues are emotive. Religion, I think we can all know, <laughs> religion is emotive. So now we're mixing them up and we're doing interfaith. We have, these are, I mean, it's an incredible interfaith platform in itself. You see Muslims, Christians, Hindus working together uh, with a shared vision in a way which in some other sectors, you, you, you may not see that within the same kind of uh, strength of collaboration. So I think in terms of one kind of need, and this is maybe why this has been working because it, it has, as I was referencing the Waze who were kind of at the founding of this. I mean, Reverend Kobia is the former general secretary of the World Council of Churches. So there's a lot of actual behind the scenes uh, wisdom um, of how this thing can come to birth, how it can move. Um, then, you know, uh, we've got the restoration community of world-class, uh, when we're going to hear from Mika, you know, this EU-funded uh, multi-country uh, restoration programs, all the experience that that needs to do that. Um, so this is a very synergistic thing, but just to share that I think uh, one hope coming out of this, Laura, is that we really have a, we strengthen the coordination uh, and having like a working group around this where we consolidate these uh, different expertises into a, into a working group and into a coordinating group that really helps to steer all this energy forward so that we can, we can get that cohesion and that critical mass of all these amazing initiatives coming together. And then maybe uh, we have a chance for to solve these terrible uh, challenges that we're facing. Thank you. No, oh, thank you so much, Alan. Um, I'll now move on to the last uh, panelist. That's Mika Bonya Ching. Welcome, Mika. So Mika is currently the manager of the Regreening Africa program, which is a program under the Center for International Forest Research and ECRAF 
and it aims to regenerate land in eight sub-Saharan countries from Ethiopia to Senegal. She also could develop the stakeholder approach for risk-informed and evidence-based decision-making that shared, which is a demand-driven, tailored, and interactive engagement for co-negotiation of decisions for mutual agreed actions or outcomes. So Mika's over 15 years experience working on various topics such as natural resource management and working in the global tropics with a focus on Africa and also Australia. So welcome Mika. I hope you can Thank you Laura. Us. Yes, Thank perfectly. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and for bringing that um, faith-based perspective to this uh, panel, uh, sorry, the um, research perspective. So um, how, I think the question that we have for you today is now, how do you think research can support faith-based institutions in restoration? You can cite some examples based on maybe the work and your experience with the Reclaiming Africa program and other programs as well. Thank you so much, Laura. And really, I've really enjoyed the last three hours. Such incredible examples, cases from restoration led by different faith communities, as well as statements about the care for caring for nature and the protection of nature from these different perspectives. And I think it's really critical. So I just wanted to give a tiny little bit of background. Regreening Africa obviously is involved in this movement by supporting the creation of these different action groups coming out of the, the scaling conference that we had last year. But Regreening Africa is doing that because it believes that it takes everybody. It's a, it's a partnership. It's a collaboration across all different types. It takes government, civil society, faith leaders, researchers, donors to come together to achieve what are very, very big ambitions against very, very big challenges that we have in terms of degraded landscape in Kenya and across Africa. And so I'm really passionate about the role of faith leaders because I think that is one of the areas that's not been brought in sufficiently into this dialogue. You can see from today, there is so much passion. There are so many good examples to be scaled. Regreeting Africa um, being funded by the European Union is almost coming to a close in this current phase, but it really has tried to focus on not just trying to scale like a project, but think a little bit broader. How do we create movements? what is needed to support all of these different groups and people that want to work positively to be able to achieve the best that they can. So from a research perspective, because I work at C4 ICRAF, um, many people would know ICRAF or World Agroforestry in Nairobi, Kenya. And from a research perspective, I think there are a few key elements, probably three key areas that research can really contribute to the role of faith-based communities in restoration. And I'll draw some examples from Regreening Africa and others. So these three key areas are capacity, skills and knowledge, monitoring, and also researching what is happening in the restoration space and bringing that knowledge back into the planning and implementation. So if we look at the capacity building dimension, we know that there is a lot of local knowledge around landscape restoration. There's a lot of collective knowledge from civil society, community, NGOs, groups working on on landscape restoration, but we also know that there is scientific information and we can bring all of that together to inform future restoration initiatives. There is also the capacity to bring different people with different knowledge to provide capacity building. And through this uh, movement on landscape restoration in Kenya, there's the development of a capacity strengthening program that's already been launched and has started with some of its activities looking at youth, women, and particularly faith-based communities. And so within that, we have different dimensions, all the way from resource mobilization to communication, social media, looking at gender integration, monitoring, and also the knowledge that we have amongst all of us on restoration that can be shared. From a research perspective, we've spent a lot of time at World Agroforestry, looking at obviously agroforestry, so the integration of trees within these landscapes, but really trying to focus on the right tree in the right place for the right purpose. So not just going there and planting millions of trees that could die because there's no one to water them, or that are the wrong trees and maybe are not going to produce products that people need or are too close to a waterway and could suck that water. So bringing that knowledge, and I think that would be my call to this group, how do we work together to collectively develop a restoration guide 
with faith-based messages that can be used across all of the different faith communities for restoration. And I think that's a really critical element to bring together. The second dimension is around monitoring. We've already brought the Regreening Africa app to some of the different groups and some trainings to really put the power to monitor the work that these communities are doing into their hands, developing tools that they can monitor the work that's taking place on the ground and then also be able to have access to that data, to be able to use this to really show the contribution of faith communities to restoration in the country. And I saw in the chat, someone asked about policy by showing the work that's happening and the potential and the opportunity that can also have an influence on the policy dimension. And the last area that I'd like to touch on is around research. We know that there is a lot of experience at local level, but it is always positive to be able to track the changes that are taking place. We have the best of intentions. Can we also understand when we're trying to do restoration, who's benefiting, what type of impacts it's having, so that we can learn from our past efforts, see what has worked and scale that, and see where maybe things have not been successful and share those challenges. And so looking at understanding the processes and then integrating that knowledge that we collect collaboratively, so local knowledge, scientific knowledge, bringing that knowledge to inform future planning and implementation for restoration. So those three areas are really around capacity, bringing knowledge into the faith communities, supporting or monitoring research and integration of evidence. And my call to this group is let's work collectively through the leadership of this faith-based action group that has formed to develop some sort of guidance that can be used across different faith communities to really demonstrate how to do restoration well and the different faith uh, statements that support restoration in the country. So back to you, Laura, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Mika, and thank you for mentioning those three key items. And I think now the challenge that I can pose to uh, the, mem the, uh, the participants who are trained on the Regreening Africa app is for us to present something during the conference that's coming up uh, later this month on the 24th and 20th. 5th of November. So you, you receive the training and we'd love to see what you're doing because it's really important to monitor, just to monitor and show people this is what we've done, this is the progress we've made, this is the impact we've made, and the app really helps to do that. So if we can do that by the time we're doing the conference, that would be great. And of course, if you're here, um, yes, thank you so much, Mika, for uh, sharing the link to the conference on the Reclaiming Africa website. And um, I think uh, just to continue on that point just briefly that Mika was making on monitoring is that I think from the presentations we saw that financial support is required. So when you require support, when someone funds and if you're looking for donors, it's really important to be able to show them that this is the work that I'm doing. This is the impact that I'm having. And it's not. I'm not just saying that I'm doing this and not doing it at all. So thank you so much, Mika. And thank you to all our panelists. I think Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim left, but Madam Sujata is still here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mika. Thank you, Alan. And uh, just before I hand over to the team that's doing the closing remarks, I'd just like to add that this has been really a great session and that this webinar was is part of a bigger conference. It's part of it's part of the conference, the Kenya National Landscape Restoration Scaling Conference. It was one of the thematic webinars. So we had the conference last year, we had the action groups which were formed around the various themes, one being this action group that has organized this webinar on faith based, um, the faith-based restoration action group. And now the this year, now we decided to do a series of pre-thematic webinars as well. And this was one of them. So th the outcomes of this webinar will be presented during the conference, uh, the main session that's on the 24th, uh, the 25th of uh, November, but also 24th is the day of the conference. You can come and see how to engage with the county governments. You know, this is about partnerships, it's about movement building. So it's important for us as faith communities or representatives of faith communities to be present at such kind of forums where governors, where directors of county, of, the, of environment and maybe agriculture are talking about the plans they have at a county level, because now we know that um, all the financing has been decentralized to the county level. So that's, I'd like to welcome you all to take part in the conference. And thank you so much, Mika, for sharing all the details there. So I'd like to invite 
Um, to, we have two uh, speakers who are going to give closing remarks. That's Dr. Lanchana and Reverend Jane Gilani, um, if she's here. Uh, Reverend Jane, are you still here with us? I am. Okay, great. So uh, before I hand over to you, I'd just like to thank everyone again for their participation, for their patience. It's been a long time. It's been more than three hours. Thank you so much. And I hope you've learned. And I'm happy to see all the contacts being shared. We'll definitely share the information and the presentations with you. And we're also going to share, we're going to organize for networking. I saw the, um, um, someone sharing about the Kenya Faith Tree Growing Committee, and we'll definitely connect to that. So over to you, uh, Alan and uh, Reverend Jane, and now maybe you can give in two minutes, one minute each or two minutes each, some closing remarks on what you think is the way forward, what are the opportunities? And I'll start with you, uh, Reverend Jane. Uh, no, I'll start with you, Alan, sorry. <laughs> yeah, what do you think is the way forward when it comes to... Um, the opportunities, faith-based restoration in Kenya and faith-based approaches in general. Wow, um, thank you so much. Um, I think, it, you know, this has been an incredible, it's been incredible also how this webinar has just come out. And I think in that you can see the dynamic of the synergy. I think also the way just observing how you, Laura and Dawn and the ICREF regreening team have worked with some of the faith <clears throat> groups, maybe like Minda Trust, you know, to improve their, you know, to bring them into this, uh, you know, national bigger forum, that synergy of getting the visibility, getting the understanding and the insight. So I think it's really building on the synergies as, as Mika was saying, uh, pointing out, and I'm guilty of this. I mean, I'm one who's planted trees uh, and, and, and they've died. And, uh, you know, uh, you see one species which grows and the other species su has surprised me that it died um, and have not known why. Um, and I think uh, without that uh, close partnership with um, the restoration community, whether it's ICRAF or KEFRI, these organizations, we may be planting millions of trees and finding that we're not succeeding. Um, so that, whereas the technicals, they, they so much need the community, the moral influence, the passion. So the synergy, I think, Laura, I mean, just uh, fostering the synergy, that idea that Mika shared, having a, a restoration guide for, for faith communities, what an amazing uh, uh, resource that could be. So maybe we need to have our follow-up uh, working groups and see how we can build on the synergies that are coming out and have these uh, concrete uh, programs that we can work on together, like the Restoration Guide, uh, like more uh, conferences and getting out into the field together. As Jane was saying, we can do the training. We don't need to be in hotels. We can be in a mosque somewhere uh, and the movement can grow. So growing the movement. So this has just been an awesome uh, springboard uh, for that. So thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Alan. I've just realized that maybe before Reverend Jane closes, I think, Katha, if you want to say a word or two as one of the leads for the group, that would be great. Just a, a sentence or two, what you think needs to be done. Thank you, Laura. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I would echo what Alan has said. What we have seen mm -hmm. works is really building partnerships. Because what one group has or what one organization has, the other doesn't have. But together, you join them and you can accomplish what would otherwise not have been accomplished. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage creating partnerships. And uh, that's, I think that's a good way to move forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Nkatha. Uh, Reverend Jane, you're been honored to close Are the meeting. Yes. Yeah. Can, what I like can is we? That, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. What I like to add here is that I've heard that we should work collectively from uh, Mika, and that is good. And I've also heard that we are all collaborators in this stewardship that God has given us over us. Mm -hmm. So I, I also like that there should be connectivity 
between researchers and uh, uh, human rights defenders, whom we didn't get hear much, and religious leaders, because uh, we have been given a responsibility by God. And uh, from the hearings we've had, we've had uh, the different roles that faith-based uh, action groups are doing. And I think going forward, we need to have an interface with the scientists. And as Mika has said, we would then be able to, to do local level tracking, yeah? Knowing who is benefiting where, at, at what time and uh, monitoring, I think is a very important um, aspect of this work that we'll do together collectively. And so mechanisms must be put in place where the faith-based action interfaces with the research and the human rights dependence and the government. And I'm glad we are having this um, conference coming 24th, 25th because it's a God-given responsibility. And whether it is the government of the day, whether it is the devolved government and us in the faith and uh, then human rights defenders and, uh, and uh, yeah, everybody, yes, uh, children, youth, women, men, associations, they should all come on board. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Reverend Jane, and thank you everyone for this, uh, for your participation, for your engagement. I hope it was a useful, um, you learned a lot and now you'll be thinking of integrating a faith-based approach or supporting faith-based faith, -based faith um, communities in their restoration efforts. So thank you all and have a lovely afternoon.